afternoon, everyone. We're going to call the meeting to order just out of respect for everybody's time. We've got a tremendous collection of city leadership here in the room. Appreciate the opportunity to come together today to talk about emergency management. Uh, first, before I say a few words on that, just want to recognize for anyone who's who may be celebrating, I just want to say Ramadan Mubarak, and I hope you have a wonderful celebration over the over the coming days. Um, you know, emergency management is one of those things that many folks, most of us may think we have the luxury of not thinking about until something terrible happens and then you're really glad that somebody was thinking about it. And that's kind of the role of all of us in this room and we all have a really important role to play in ensuring that we are prepared. I don't need to give you a lecture on that because we've all been through, you all have been through it on the front lines. Uh, particularly over the last couple of years, but whether it's pandemics or floods or we know it's not a question of if, it's really a question of when we will have the next big earthquake in our region, we know that unexpectedly uh, we are going to have things arise that require us to snap into action uh, and, and carry out emergency operations. And the fact that we're taking the time to proactively review what we've learned and the role that we all play, including those of us on the council, I think is really gonna serve us well in the years ahead. The one thing we can control is our level of preparedness. So I, I'm just grateful to Jennifer, Lee, Kip, and everyone in the administration who's brought us together and made this study session possible. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jennifer to share a few more thoughts. Yes, thank you, We Mayor. also need to do roll call. Oh, and I'm sorry, let's call roll so we can actually start. Jimenez? Present. Cohen? Ortiz? Davis? Here. Doan? Candelas? Here. Foley? Here. Batra? Here. Kame? Here. Mahan? Here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so thank you very much, Mayor, and thank you, City Council, for being here today and all the, s the senior staff and others that are here um, to help us with this very important study session today. Uh, we're going to be exploring our, city man our city's emergency management efforts today. But I want to first begin by acknowledging the exceptional teamwork displayed by our Emergency Operations Center, also known as our EOC. You'll hear that word a lot today. Um, all of our staff, our field teams, and all city departments that have been involved in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic and the 14, yes, 14 other emergency activations we have had since the 2017 floods. Their tireless efforts, dedication, and adaptability have been instrumental in protecting the health and well-being of our community. As we continue to navigate the evolving landscape of emergencies and disasters, it is paramount that we remain steadfast in our commitment to train and exercise our EOC and field teams. This ongoing preparation ensures that we are ready to respond to any disaster, whether natural or man-made, with the same level of efficiency and coordination that we have demonstrated during the pandemic. The role of the City Council in these efforts cannot be overstated. Your leadership is essential for continuity of government and maintaining a strong connection with our communities. Your support, guidance, and communication with your constituents are vital in fostering trust and resilience within our community. In all aspects of emergency management, we must ma remain deeply committed to equity. It is our responsibility to ensure that the most vulnerable and burdened members of our community are not disproportionately affected by disasters. By incorporating equity considerations into our planning, response, and recovery efforts, we can create a more inclusive and compassionate city for all. Together, we have proven that we can effectively respond to unprecedented challenges. Now, let us build upon our successes and continue to strengthen our emergency preparedness, ensuring that our city remains resilient and ready to face whatever challenges may lie ahead. Thank you. And I think I'm turning it over to Kip or Lee? Ray. Oh, Ray. Ray. Hey, Ray. Thank you, Ray. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members, Executive Staff, City Members, and attendees today. I'm Ray Reardon, the Director of the Office of Emergency Management. Today's session is going to be a little bit different than our typical study sessions and our City Council meetings. We've structured the program into two modules uh, where we do pre present information at the beginning about how we have operated these past emergencies. 
uh, the role of the city council, the, the operations of the disaster district office. Then the second module will have a scenario where we walk through an earthquake scenario in response and how the city may respond uh, at that time. Next slide. There will be an opportunity for public comment as well if you can. So exercises always uh, are designed and have a clear measurable objective. So the three me objectives we have today are listed here. is to engage the elected officials in a discussion of what to do during an emergency. Engage the elected officials in a discussion of what emergency management organization does in response, which includes the emergency operations center and our department operations centers. During the discussion, staff will also reveal how the plans and procedures that we've been developing over the years help guide our response. So the focus of today is on how the city organization responds to an event and how we communicate with you, the elected officials. I do want to recognize that we rely on many nonprofit organizations to help support our response, uh, uh, response needs. For example, we have our community emergency response team or CERT members that uh, support the neighborhood response. We have the American Red Cross who supports our sheltering operations and the collaborating agencies, disaster relief effort uh, or cadre who helps organize other nonprofit organizations in response to the events. Next slide. Find those three objectives as we go through this, uh, this, exercise, this exercise today. today. And we will treat, treat the scenario as we get to that scenario as though it's real. Next slide. So um, I will be the facilitator for module one. Uh, and, we'll and we'll lead, lead, lead you through this. I'll be supported by Karen Chuang from our office and talking about the disaster district offices. And in module two, Lee Wilcox and Kip Harkness will lead those efforts as we get into those events. So the purpose of the module one then is to um, under, help understand, first of all, what is the Emergency Operations Center? Um, the Emergency Operations Center is to establish a centralized location for coordinating emergency response among all city departments during an incident and promote recovery operations following an incident. The role of the Office of Emergency Management then is to maintain the Emergency Operations Center readiness and maintain plans to guide the interdepartmental and interjurisdictional support when an emergency occurs. Tactical on-scene <clears throat> tactical on-scene operations are conducted from an incident command post. The role of the Department Operations Center and the Emergency Operations Center is to coordinate the different incident command posts and support the incident command post operations. And that's critical to understand that our role is not to take over an incident, but to help facilitate and coordinate the needs of the incident and what the incident commander in the field needs. So with that, I'll talk a bit, a little bit about the recent uh, emergencies over the last six years. I joined the city six years ago, right after the flood. Prior to that, I understand we only activated the, the emergency operations center twice. Now, there is no coincidence that I came and we've had 14 activations since. I just I need to put that out there right now, okay? But a little bit. <laughs> but what we've learned in all these activations is that we can, we can bring together the right resources. We don't have to bring together all the resources. We modify what resources we need to bring into effect to, the, to address the emergency as we respond to it. So here you'll see a representation of if we had a large activation. And our scenario will talk about a large activation and the need for a large activation. But a lot of these activations were on smaller scales, like one days, two day events. But can you bring up the next slide? <clears throat> of course, we had COVID as this, uh, this chart represents. It's taken over the last three years going into the fourth year. But these other events that we've had, like the flood watch was one day. It was to address the concerns that we might uh, have to face if the rains got harder. Like last year, we had win winter storms, the atmospheric rivers, and again this year, we started to bring smaller teams together because we realized we could do the operations of the EOC with an incident management team or a smaller group of folks. We don't have to have everybody. So we bring together the right resources to address that need. <clears throat> so the most recent, obviously, was the atmospheric rivers. But we've activated for other events, like a gas leak, when we had to evacuate about 100 people. Uh, and we had to address the concerns of their needs during that emergency. So we activate uh, an uh, evacuation point so that people can get information there and then go, because we're still during, uh, in the middle of COVID, we, were, or, uh, we arranged hotel rooms and accommodations like that 
So we didn't have to operate a, a congregate shelter when we were dealing also with COVID. So each one of these emergencies has been unique, but we focus first on our public communications, our public safety, shelter operations and concerns, and multi-department response and multi-agency response with the county and other responding agencies as necessary. With that, that's a summary of how we would activate uh, and have activated all these 14 events. Uh, and as we turn it on now, we will start, to, I'm gonna ask you just some basic questions. And then the basic questions are, before the storm, these are the two questions and you can respond with them together. We, before the storms, what we're concerned, and then during the storms in the atmospheric river response, what did you feel most comfortable about? And how did you feel we communicated with you from the emergency operations center? So I'll turn that over to the mayor to organ. Sorry, I was I was looking at my notes. What was that? <laughs> so we have these two questions. Yeah. And no, we're asking the council. Yeah. Okay, great. Do we have a, go ahead, Councilor Foley. Okay. Uh, I represent District 9, and Ross Creek was a big concern of flooding. So to answer the first question, I was concerned about Ross Creek flooding and affecting all of those uh, residential homes and properties. Um, what was the best thing EOC staff did? Uh, watch the river really, the Ross Creek really closely. They were there constantly. I drove by it constantly and there was always city staff there reporting to us regularly the level, uh, the water level and the concerns to the community so that we could communicate. And also uh, just having staff out there really quickly and easily communicating with the neighbors of the risks that could be potentially coming. Thank goodness it never happened, but the neighbors were prepared and, and so were we. And I was really grateful for the real open lines of communication that occurred. And I thought you did a fabulous job in that situation. Great, thanks council member. Other council members we'll go with Councilor Torres. Uh, it looked like council member. Yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I was just gonna, yeah. yeah, thank you for that. I was just going to say that the, the thing that, that the concerns and fears I had immediately went to some of our in-house population, how they were going to be impacted by some of the storms and such. And and, and I think the, the best thing the EOC staff did, I know I exchanged text, text, text with uh, Kip about some of the efforts and keeping me up to date uh, on some of that. I think it was really good. I think in the past, sometimes if I, I mean, it didn't necessarily, well, it did impact my district to a certain extent because we moved some of the folks uh, out of Seven Trees. Uh, but oftentimes I think that if our, and I felt this way, if, if my district isn't necessarily directly impacted, I often feel a little lost as to what's happening elsewhere. Um, but this time I felt a little bit more connection as it relates to what was going on. So I appreciated that. Others, Council Member Torres, and then we'll go to Batra. So we, we definitely learned from 2017. And so it, for me, it was uh, really happy to know that uh, we had all hands on deck, both at Coyote Creek and the Guadalupe River. Uh, but those were the, the concerns, right? Nagley Park and Olinder folks calling us. My very first few days in, uh, uh, in office, uh, calling us uh, worried that it was gonna flood. Same thing with the Guadalupe River, right? Uh, and so, uh, you know, the Washington neighborhood uh, kept either texting me or emailing our office regarding the Guadalupe River, but we did a, a, a pretty good job of, um, you know, easing those, those, those concerns. So we, this city, our city, we definitely learned from, from 2017. Uh, so, you know, clearing our own house from the, from the creeks was, was great, but also I think when even our residents pinpointed a buildup of uh, all the fallen trees, our city crews went out there when they could to make sure that it was cleared so it doesn't so it didn't spew into our neighborhood. So, so definitely uh, working together uh, worked. Uh, what's the best thing? What's the best thing EOC staff did to help communicate? Oh, no, that you all were very communicative towards us. And anytime we had an idea, we would text Kip and or Lee at one o'clock in the morning, and they'll still answer. So, um, I just want to commend all of you for doing such an, an amazing job and. Um, making sure that we didn't have another 2017 in our hands, because unfortunately we're still, you know, seeing the the negative effects of on that. Councilor Batra. For us, the big concerns were 
the what the wind storms which were coming with the water storms and and the impact on trees how many trees were going to fall how safe you were going to be and the mm, power outages which were likely to happen as a result of that and we did have tree fall down on the Almaden expressway uh, which was quickly attended to and the blockages of traffic didn't stay too long uh, power outage we know around 350,000 people got affected by that our district did have the same kind of story uh, there were many people affected by that one um, so the what we were fearful of a lot of it did happen uh, the best part is we at least were getting communications on what was getting affected what was being taken care of so as a result knowing what the impact is people were able to bear bear it a little less uncomfortably so that's the best part done by the EOC in our cases thank you Thanks, council member vice mayor yes thank you you know each time um i know they're becoming more frequent but we're, we get better and better so uh thank you so much for uh all the work that you do to ensure that we're all safe um you know during the um flood you know the flooding and the storm the early part of the in january the storms um, I really felt a lot of the communication was you know right on and I'm really delighted that um, amongst o uh, different um, organizations uh, the communication was great um, I think that um, and I don't know it was just uh, my being a little relaxed uh, but during the power outages I felt that I wasn't as on top of it as I could have been I know that um, I recently had office hours and one of the complaints was we need to know more we need to know where the closures um, and I think that people were um, sort of um, taken off you know sort of um, a little bit not prepared for days of being without power right uh, but I think that as we move forward the frequency of which these things might happen are going to be much more so you know I look forward to um, having uh, ways of being better at communicating that out letting people know what areas and I think um, at the meeting at our meeting it was really great that Lee gave us the the map uh, but I think that um, that wasn't sufficient I think that people wanted to know where do I go to know like what's going to happen because to know that the lights are going to be back Friday and it's like three days away it's like oh my gosh what am I going to do so I think that you know uh, perhaps having more uh, education on preparedness and letting people know these things are going to happen and they're going to happen more frequently you know I think would be very helpful um, and I think you know the staff has been great uh, in terms of uh, some of the communication but I think that I personally need a little bit of help in making it better so Thanks, Vice Mayor. Anybody else on the council want to chime in? Councilor Rodon. Thank you, Mayor. Some of the fear was the flooding. How do we move unhoused residents? Overnight warming center or location, if you will, fallen trees. And how does our public safety department prepare for this whole new event? One of my worry is this, that a lot of our constituent understand that we have the community center, the library, the fire department, but how do we support them with food, water, you know, fuel to, for example, some, some of the fire department, uh, they, they've got generators that can run for two days, right? Let's say the major disaster, uh, earthquake, bridges will be collapsed. How do we get the fuel to the fire department? How do we get for people who congregate in the community center and going toward the fire department with no, there's no food or water and implementation? That, that's part of my, my worries. But on, on the other hand, I, I, you guy was incredible in a very clear, concise com communication, both email, in person, in presentation. 
letting us know where and when the flood's gonna happen, what action you're going to take, and what is the outcome that you're looking for. And, and I have to say, you guys did an incredible job. We, we've learned from 2017, because I remember I was on the third floor looking down at the flood on Center Row there, and uh, we, we activated you know, um, the emergency EOC at that point. And, uh, and we've, we've learned a lot, and I, and, and I appreciate that you guys put together exercise like this and continue with many other departments to prepare for the major disaster. And it's not if, it's when it's gonna happen. And, and, and the, my thought process is the, the next earthquake is gonna really shock all of us. And I, I wanna thank you again for being prepared. Thanks, Council Member. Any other comments? I'll just uh, very quickly add, you know, when the storms first hit in January, it was definitely a crash course for me in the role of being mayor. It's a little different um, in that the charter places the responsibility for communicating on behalf of the city within the mayor's office. We have to be in tight coordination because, frankly, I didn't know what I was talking about. I was third day on the job. Lee and I are at a <laughs> press conference. <laughs> press is coming to our office every day asking for answers. And while my concern was, of course, for our unhoused community, for flooding, really fundamentally for me is about communication. You know, I did not want to say anything that was going to confuse people or make matters worse or commit to something that we couldn't deliver. And I was just incredibly grateful to have uh, Lee. I know I think Jennifer may have even been traveling for a couple. It was, it was like this perfect storm, excuse the pun, where it was like third day on the job, Jennifer's traveling, and really, Lee, Kip, and Carolina, just we were doing briefings every few hours and understanding where water levels were and what I should and shouldn't communicate. And it was just highly collaborative, super professional, extremely efficient. Briefings could be three minutes on the phone if that was all they needed to be. We didn't have to go on and on and on, but just what are the facts? What can we share? What's relevant to the community that we can communicate at this point? And frankly, I just kind of plugged into a system that already exists, which is how it should be, right? I mean, you all, you all have, I, I don't want to say perfected, but have built a really excellent operation for identifying issues and solutions. And, and I know we'll talk more about this today. But I was, I was extremely impressed and grateful. And um, it's, yeah, it's, it's an impressive operation that city staff has figured out how to set up through the, how many times, 14 times, Ray? You're really earning that paycheck. Um, so, yeah, great, grateful for uh, the, that, that muscle that we've built here at the city. Mayor. Uh, sure. So I, I want to leave folks with this. I was then working for Councilmember Carrasco. And in 2017, one of our, one of our District 7 residents, whom uh, I established a relationship as a Franco McKinley School Board member, literally called me uh, because our, we, the city didn't notify anybody. Santa Clara Water didn't no notify anybody. Of course, that's, you know, no one's to blame here because uh, we've learned our lesson. But called me saying, it uh, looks like the water is creeping uh, into my apartment. And I was like, what, wait, what's going on here? Um, and 25, 30 minutes later, her apartment is underwater. Uh, I rush as a, you know, a proactive council aide or city employee and she is, you know, then at that point, our fire department is actually has her on a boat getting her out of the water. But that's the last, lasting impression that I never want to have as a council member, and you all shouldn't have either, because this time around, we were ready, and this time around, uh, we were prepared. And so I'll leave you that with, with that image that in 2017, that's the, it's, I hate to say it, but, you know, uh, that that's what was that that's what occurred in 2017 right our residents didn't know what was happening they got flooded and we got caught off guard and that didn't happen this time so i'll leave it at that all right thanks council member uh in the spirit of continuous improvement let's get back to the rest of the session go ahead ray the next section is obviously this these few emergencies these q14 um, have been manageable within uh, our communications capabilities, our ability to communicate with you, et cetera. 
Now let's talk about if a major emergency, another major emergency comes, what is the purpose of a disaster district office? How can, you, uh, how can we communicate with you and facilitate that? And what would you do in managing your constituents and communicating with them? With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Karen Chirong from our office to walk through the next uh, several slides. operational guide and plan to continue to work with their respective staff to review and update the guide for their specific council district needs. As Ray had mentioned, the purpose of the disaster district office is here um, for during an emergency to allow council members to continue to maintain and support kind of government operations and essential services and to serve as a liaison for their constituents to provide and share critical information and updates from their respective council district. A disaster district office is not a responder, such as a first responder. It serves more as a coordination point and amplifier of information for each council district. The Emergency Operations Center would work closely with the disaster district offices to ensure information is provided as early and often. In return, the disaster district office would share any critical needs and impacts in their council district to coordinate the appropriate responses needed. Now, a disaster district office can be considered a physical or a remote site, depending on the emergency, community needs, availability of resources, and the safety for the staff and the public. If a physical site is considered, City Hall is, con is an option. But what happens if City Hall isn't available to us? I've been working with each council district to identify alternative sites that are centrally located within this district, easily accessible to the public, and large enough to continue to support council district operations. If a remote site is considered, this may, be, may be due to potential safety concerns for the public and staff to report to a physical site. So for example, stay-at-home orders, um, are dangerous or inclement weather conditions, or any debris blocking of roadway access. So on the next slide, you will see a flow chart. Um, in the situation manual, this flow chart is also available on page eight. Um, and for mayor and city council, there is also a laminated uh, chart that you can use as well. So as you can see on this flow chart, there are four levels there's prepare, monitor, watch, and activate. This also corresponds with the four emergency operation center activation levels. The emergency operation center activation levels are based on the scale and complexity of an emergency or incident, with normal at the top being business as usual, and level one at the bottom being the most complex emergency that requires the most resources and coordination. Depending on the conditions of the emergency, the activation level may need to escalate from top to bottom or de-escalate from bottom to top or even skip an activation level. Now I'm gonna go, go ahead and take, through the th take you through the different steps. So at the prepare level or business as usual, this is an opportunity to review and update emergency plans, participate in trainings, and encourage the personal preparedness within our community to be prepared for any type of emergency that we may encounter. During the monitor level or activation level four, this is when if uh, an incident or emergency had occurred and it triggers emergency notifications and monitoring of the situation. In the diagram, you'll see EPIO, which stands for Emergency Public Information Officer, they help develop emergency communications and vet information before going out to the public. Once information is developed, it will be shared to the public and also the Emergency Operations Center or in the diagram, EOC liaisons. And from there, City Council will receive information through the City Council liaison. Information can also be shared from the field or at the City Council level. 
and in turn that will provide information to the emergency operations center as a whole. This communication feedback loop helps maintain situational awareness of the uh, incident for both the emergency operations center and also at the city council level. The next level is the watch level or activations level two or three. This is when the incident or emergency continues to escalate. And there are two processes here that I will walk you through um, by using our recent activation level or recent incident, the winter storms and atmospheric river event. So during this event, one of the first questions that we had to ask ourselves was, is there a proclamation of a local emergency needed? Once we had confirmed and ratified the proclamation, the next question was, is a disaster district office needed to support the community? So during this time, given the fact that the event was localized and parts of the city were impacted, and the fact that council districts were still able to maintain their operations from City Hall and maintain emergency communications with their constituents and the emergency operations center, we did not activate the disaster district office in, in any of the council districts. Now, as previously mentioned earlier, if we had a catastrophic earthquake where we anticipate citywide impacts, responsive communication lines are disrupted, we anticipate that a local emergency would also be proclaimed in this time. The emergency operations center would be activated at level one and this would be the time where a, di a disaster district office would be considered to be activated as well to ensure that we can support the community at the ground level. When a, a disaster district office is activated, we will have to think about where to place the disaster district office, how to get our staff uh, to that site, and coordinate uh, goals and objectives for that office and ensure that the emergency operations center and the disaster district office are connected by using that communication feedback loop to ensure information um, is shared throughout um, the incident itself. Now as of date, fortunately, a disaster district office has not been activated in the city of San Jose, but in order for us to remain resilient and prepared, it's important to continue our planning efforts for the disaster district office. Thank you for your time. Can I ask a question? It's very district specific, but during redistricting, I actually gave away my disaster preparedness letter to District 10. <laughs> and so can you, can you remind me what the status was? And I, I'm trying to recall our conversation about, because I'm sure, I mean, we, we, the district boundaries exist, but they're, you know, We're going to work out to have some more time to figure out exactly what other sites. Right. Thank you. Okay, on to module two. Oh. Go ahead, Bill. It can come from both. You, if you feel the need to communicate with your community, you can activate that. You just need to not notify us that you're, you would like to activate it. That way we can establish the communications and, and go e either what direction. Okay, so it can either come from the EOC director to say, hey, activate it because we know enough is happening. Correct. Or it can come from the other way around that we know there's enough happening in the district I would like to activate the DDO. And okay. that's why the communication okay. is so important uh, ahead of time or when the decision's made. Okay. I was going to say, it's a very good question, too. And maybe when we get into the tabletop exercise, since we're sitting next to each other, I will nudge you and you can ask it again. Because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> you will get that opportunity and direct that uh, to a, our emergency operations center director um, on how that would probably come about. That's a, a good scenario for everyone, I think. 
Okay. All right. All right. Next slide. So I'm Lee Wilcox, Assistant City Manager. I'm going to start us off for Module Two. We're going to review a uh, continuity of operations plan. A little bit about the EOC structure, what it looks like, feels like. Um, go over an earthquake scenario, which is the purpose of today's tabletop exercise, and then jump into that exercise. So a few things. During that tabletop exercise, each of you uh, will have the ability to interrupt myself or Kip uh, two times. Once your two times is up, we, we get to ignore you until everyone has gone two times. Um, and the purpose of that is, I just want to clarify, a tabletop exercise really just helps define roles and responsibilities. So this might be a bad analogy, um, but I'll make it anyway. Who's put together IKEA furniture before? Raise your hand. So you open the box, there's like 600 parts and two pictures of a guy with a wrench. Like, <laughs> that's really not enough <laughs> for me anyway to put together furniture. Um, so I watch a YouTube video. Like, someone has built this before, right? Consider this the YouTube video. It's really looking at, oh, if, if something happens, this is what might occur. We're not walking out with a finished product. You do not need to walk out with a work plan for your district office and what you will be doing. This is just a really high level overview of one scenario and how communication might happen between the city manager and her team and the council and then staff in the community. So take it for that. Don't feel like you need to walk out with all the answers because the, the, the exercise certainly won't do that. Um, and then we'll end with Jennifer making some closing remarks. Next slide. So continuity of operations is very important in, in any disaster, um, any event. On behalf of the city manager, um, the assistant city manager for San Jose is responsible for navigating the world of what if, which quickly evolves into what now, um, provi by providing guidance, direction, prioritization of resuming activities and services um, after a disturbance or disaster or any other type of event. Continuity of operations fundal fundamentally requires a succession framework and associated delegations of authority throughout the organization placed prior to an event occurring. One thing um, that, we'll be uh, that I'll be touching upon in a second is we are doing a very large, very extensive process with all departments, all appointees right now to modernize and bring up to date our continuity of operations plan in the city of San Jose. Um, and I'll touch upon that. The one thing that I wanted to talk about was our experience with COVID. Um, while we had plans in place and a, a very high level uh, continuity of operations plan in place, we didn't technically have one for a global pandemic. We were very fortunate in that sort of like, unlike you know, a tornado or an earthquake, which happens very quickly, that you know, some people in the organization saw this coming, so we had time to plan. It was really the process of Kip, myself, Jennifer, Dave Sykes, all the department directors in the city starting to do that continuity of operations planning, like what is going to happen when we shut down the county's just made this request around food distribution, so we're going to need to have these resources that led us to Sunday night at 9 o'clock, the, the Tuesday before shelter in place, us bringing every single director into the city saying we're closing down now because we knew we were going to need resources to support the emergency operations center. And so with an earthquake, which will be today's scenario, we need to have things on the shelves and plans on the shelf to act very immediately because a lot of the times we won't have that luxury. Important to note that continuity of operations plan happens concurrently and in parallel with all activities in the emergency operations center. So once the emergency operations center is activated, you'll still continue to hear a lot from Jennifer and from me, the EOC director. What you, you aren't seeing and what's typically not discussed is the three of us are probably chatting every 12 hours on kind of the, the situation status, making policy decision on what may go into an emergency uh, action plan in the EOC and what we may or may not be doing in the way of influencing services to bring back or quite frankly put on hold so that we can divert resources to the emergency operations center to support any response. So there's a balance and a lot of conversation there as we move forward in those type of responses. One of the things we also do 
is our uh, part of the uh, continuity of operations plan is our continuity of government how we're going to bring all of you together and make decisions if some of you will remember councilmember foley jimenez and davis one of our very last council meetings in person was in this room and you guys were spread out everywhere with very few of us in here because we needed you guys to proclaim a local emergency um, and we didn't have the zoom capability at that point it's a long time ago <laughs> The continuity of operation plans also helps ensure a clear pathway to, con uh, to continuing services. Each disaster brings its own unique um, uh, you know, variables to a situation and there's critical services that our community depends on and quite frankly, our first responders need them to, um, uh, to go ahead and continue to rely on so that we can serve the ones that are in the greatest need in those disasters. So the last things that it does, it does establish a framework to ensure that each of the San Jose uh, city departments, the various divisions, uh, have the ability to carry out these missions regardless of what happens, the technology and the internal coordination to do so. So right now we're going through a series of, of six steps and we're currently in steps two and three for our own continuity of operations plan, but this includes step one, identifying a mission business critical functions that need to continue no matter what, identify resources that suppo uh, support those critical functions, anticipate potential um, contingencies or disasters. Um, we are uh, what we refer to as all hazards, comprehensive emergency management uh, profession in the city, which means we plan around floods, earthquakes, fires, global pandemics, uh, gas leaks. So all of those um, with 98 core services and 264 uh, programs requires, you know, a lot of large matrices to, to figure out how we proceed uh, given the circumstances. And uh, lastly, test, revise these strategies continuously. So we are working our way through this, this program um, and this plan will be complete by the end of the calendar year um, and allow us uh, to be more proactive and more set when the next disaster does occur. So with that, I'm gonna hand the EOC overview to Kip Harkness. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager and the Emergency Operations Center Director. You see before you kind of a mock-up of what the Emergency Operations Center would look like. Um, it is essentially uh, a framework for an organization that's designed to be scalable, flexible, um, and have clear focus and clear command structure. Um, the vests represent the different sections of the organization uh, with management wearing the black vests because I, I like to wear black vests all the time. Uh, and then the different colors which we'll go through representing the different key sections. Uh, it's important to note that while there are in many cases a correlation between the department and the role, the, one of the beauties of the Emergency Operations Center is we can staff that role with whoever the appropriate person is, or in the case where we uh, have to rearrange chairs a bit, whoever is able to make it in and it can be put into that position and has the authority and the clarity to do the work. So it's a very flexible, agile organizational framework that, again, we can scale and adapt to, to any of the all hazards that, that we plan and prepare for. So I want to actually have each of the section coordinators introduce themselves and introduce uh, very quickly the role of their, their section. So we'll, we'll start with the orange vests, and that is the operations section. Rob Lloyd is our operations section coordinator. Red vests, I call them orange. I, I apparently have color issues. Uh, red vests. <laughs> One mic that's not working. <laughs> we'll see how they respond. <laughs> Thanks, Chief. Can you hear me, guys? Yes. Right. Yeah. The operations section of the EOC, Rob Lloyd, um, is responsible for managing all tactical operations of an activated incident. The operations section chief oversees the section and manages safe response activities, executing the operations portion of the action plan and requesting and assigning resources in support of those operations. All right, then I'm gonna go to logistics and what I think is yellow vest. <laughs> Thank you, Kip. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Walter Lin, I'm a Deputy Director of Public Works. My role in the EOC is section, is the uh, logistics section coordinator. Uh, our role is really to provide that support function for all of the other sections within the EOC. 
uh, mainly to provide supplies, equipment, material, services, help to make immediate repair and restoration of the municipal facilities providing that emergency response. Um, to uh, Council Member uh, Doan's uh, inquiry. Uh, our role is also to ensure that the generators are uh, operable and refueled as well too. So from a longer term self-sustaining aspect of an emergency response, uh, we can do so with the fuel reserves of the equipment that we have and that we can procure. And one of my favorite roles that the logistics exception play is making sure that we're fed and making sure that the field is fed, which is actually non-trivial during, during this kind of work. Uh, next section, uh, appropriately green for the green eye shades, uh, we have finance. Good afternoon. I'm Alice Birch with the finance department. I'm the finance and administration section coordinator. Um, our role is really the financial recovery, purchasing, payroll, timekeeping, and the general ledger activities within the EOC, just making sure everything continues to function and everybody is, we get the money back if we can. Yeah, I just want to emphasize that last one. We, we get the money back if we can without the proper documentation, which is very, very complicated and tedious and time consuming. Uh, these are only theoretically reimbursable events. And so that, that, that role is extremely important, not only in the immediacy of the purchasing wor work, but also in the long term recovery of, on the f fiscal and financial side. Um, then we also have uh, a recovery section, which is a, a kind of an innovation within our EOC, and that's Gray Vest with Rosalyn. Good afternoon, Rosalyn Huey, Deputy City Manager. Um, our section is responsible for community recovery, uh, and our role really is twofold. So immediately we're coordinating on the short term recovery activities and at the same time looking forward and assessing some of the long-term needs toward recovery. Uh, focusing on people, obviously, making sure that they have the resources uh, that they need and then obviously looking into our built environment and our infrastructure uh, and looking at uh, how we recover uh, economically as well. Thank you. And then in the dark blue vest, we have a planning section. Thank you, Mayor and Council. My name is Jay McCamus. I am the Deputy Director of the Office of Emergency Management and the Planning Section Coordinator during those activations. The Planning Section is basically the data and information hub of the Emergency Operations Center. Uh, the collection, assessment, dissemination, presentation of information is the key to what it does. Uh, we are responsible for preparing the action plan and situational reports uh, that inform not just the EOC, but the field and the council when it comes to the information about what's going on and the decisions that are made. And then uh, technically within the management section, we have the EPIO, which we have in the purple vests and which we elevated, elevated essentially to their own independent branch. Thank you, Kip, Mayor, Council. I'm Carolina Camarena. During emergencies, I'm the director. And in my day job, I'm the director of communications for our city manager. What the EPIO, or the Emergency Public Information Officers Branch does, is provide culturally appropriate multilingual messages to save lives, livelihoods, and the environment. And for that, I brought a prop uh, from our last go around. This is an example of one of the signs that we were created in real time and produced in four languages, warning of flood risks, which was produced in, in coordination with our communications department, as well as our sign manufacturing crews out in the Department of Transportation, and then those crews getting those out in the field, including the FIT teams and the DOT teams. So it's a, uh, and that gives you a, a sense of what we call the fruit salad of the EOC. So you see these different colors, and the ideal within a physical e emergency operations center is that these groups are mixing back and forth. So each of them has their, their role and their, their clear reporting structure and is fully empowered to coordinate across the different sections to get things done. Um, that brings us to the, the management section, which is with the black vests and uh, led by the Emergency Operations Center Director, which is the role that I play uh, during an activation. And uh, the way that it's been described to me is that the role of the Emergency Operations Center is to be the thinker anticipating the needs of the field. As Ray said, we are not leading the incidents in the field. In fact, what we are trying to do is empower th the field to lead. They are better trained at that than we are. They know their stuff. And our job is to think ahead while they are doing their response to what they're going to need next. 
Sometimes we can get five minutes ahead of them. Sometimes we can get a few days ahead of them. Sometimes we're a few days behind. But we, if, if, uh, if, if we can get ahead and we can begin the logistics work, and get the equipment that they need to the place that they need before they even know they need it, then we're doing our job superbly well. So you will also see there are a number of what are called the department operations centers, which are represented in the row in the back. And we put them in the back not because they're less important, but because they're closer to the field and are going to be coordinating the work of the field, and will be, but will be in communication and coordination with the emergency operations center. And so uh, I won't say a whole lot more about that because I think you'll see it in play as we go forward. But uh, uh, for those of you who are historians or historically minded, you'll recognize that this model is a general staff model. So the origins of this are with the, the Prussian military in the 1880s, which realized that just having people run around and do things was not really go doing so well. And so that, that a, a general needed to have clear logistics, clear intelligence, clear operations, and very smart and capable leaders who weren't doing the field operations, thinking ahead of the field to do that coordination. And that's morphed into the incident command system, uh, SIMS and NIMS, and a whole other alphabet soup of, of uh, emergency management lingo, but represents now in its current iteration the cutting edge approach to how, how we expand and, and manage incidents. And I see it looks like a question from Omar. Okay. Yeah. Council Member Torres, excuse me. That's okay. <laughs> uh, uh, um, Kip was my boss before, so. <laughs> um, uh, so I, maybe a little bit too much of a technical question, uh, but I think it's uh, important for especially the new council members uh, to know. Uh, so I know that we, we just had finance speak. So every time uh, myself or my team would go and go hop out at the Coyote Creek floods or the, the other 14 emergencies that we had, because, you know, Magdalena let us, you know, go out there and help our, our community because, you know, she was, again, proactive. Um, we would put a, a, um, a VIS code or have to explain what we were doing. Uh, so when we apply for federal and state funds, um, is, is that why we do it? We do it for, for federal and state funds? We do. And uh, I will hand it over to Kip. I'll let it hand over to Alex. Right, and this is a good, this is a good uh, role play for how we're gonna do the rest of the session. So that question might come in to me and I would go to immediately to my experts and say, Alice, can you tell me a little bit more about why we track those time codes and what is reimbursable and what isn't in, in a large scale emergency like this? Thank you. Um, good question. And yes, we track that so that if we were given the opportunity to have a disaster declared by the federal government or by the state, that we could seek reimbursement through for the activities that we do. Um, they're very particular about making sure that we can be very specific on the activities we did, where we did it, why we did it, when we did it. And so by getting that information at the start um, and not having to recreate it later gives us more of an opportunity to be successful if we're given that opportunity to seek reimbursement. Um, typically what would be a reimbursable would be something that's overtime and not already previously budgeted okay. um, or for staff that we bring in specifically for that incident. Great. And I'm going to introduce one more branch and then hand it back over to Lee here. I want to, this is a, actually a perfect time to introduce the liaison officer who would have probably the function of dealing with many of these questions. So, Blage? Uh, sure, thanks. Thanks, Kip. Uh, so, Blage is Lalitan, Deputy Director in the Office of Economic Development. And for this exercise, I am the liaison branch director. And basically, the liaison uh, positions are all about uh, communication and coordination with all of the incoming representatives from other agencies that are in the EOC. Um, so a few of the examples of the liaison kind of team would be city council liaison, would be a private sector slash business liaison, uh, would be an EOC to EOC liaison. So uh, the county has set up their EOC, uh, intergovernmental relations liaison, um, and a schools uh, liaison. So those are a few examples. Excellent. And with that, you have a sense of it, but we'll show you it in action. And back to you, Lee. Very good question, though, Councilmember. And I would just say uh, one finer detail. Uh, within the first few hours of, of any disaster, we'd be putting a code. And quite frankly, there's a code in PeopleSoft right now. And everyone working on that would start charging to that so that we could at least have everything in the system and not cause Alice and her team to go back through thousands of employees' time cards. Um, because that 
would be really inefficient. Okay, so I have a script from Ray. I am going to do my best, uh, I don't know, Harrison Ford or Morgan Freeman voiceover <laughs> um, as I introduce this event, but why don't we go ahead and play it? So envision a bustling day in San Jose when suddenly the ground beneath us starts to shudder. A massive 7.0 magnitude earthquake erupts along the Hayward Fault and the city is gripped with the over overwhelming power of nature. In the first few minutes, the tremors intensify rapidly with the earth heaving beneath our feet. Buildings sway violently, glass shatters, and the deafening sound of tearing concrete and crashing objects uh, fill the air. Panic sets as people of the city of San Jose instinctively seek cover under tables and door frames or beneath sturdy structures that they can find. Clinging to these makeshift shelters, they brace themselves for the relentless sh shaking, praying for the turmoil to cease. As residents confront this terrifying situation, they must remember the crucial steps to ensure the safety message they received early on. Stop, cover, and hold on. By doing so, they protect themselves from falling debris and maintain the safest possible position during the earthquake. As the ground finally stills, an eerie silence descends upon the city, broken only by distant sirens, many car sirens, and uh, car alarms. People emerge from their hiding places, disoriented by the shaking, taking stock of the aftermath. Roads have cracked and buckled, buildings have collapsed or suffered severe damage, and essential services such as water, electricity, and gas are disrupted. In the moments following this quake, the city springs into action. Emergency responders rush to the scene, rapidly surveying damage and beginning to triage their own response. Residents still reeling from the shock begin to emerge scared, from bewil uh, scared and bewildered from buildings. The extent of the damage varies across the city. While some areas of the city bear minor cracks and superficial damage, other areas experience total devastation, with building collapses reduced to rubble or severely, uh, severely seismically wounded. Thousands are left homeless, businesses are destroyed, and infrastructure is severely compromised throughout the city. In the face of the disaster, the city's emergency operations center swifts uh, into uh, a few different ac uh, activities. Key personnel assemble and assess the situation, establish priorities, and coordinate a comprehensive response. The EOC becomes a nerve center for managing resources, critical decisions, making critical decisions, and communications with the public and other agencies outside of the city of San Jose. In parallel, the city's continuity of operation plans kicks into action, ensuring a focus on continued essential services during this period and starting to assess infrastructure uh, resources the city has, such as the wastewater facility. My first call, using my FirstNet phone, which will have priority access, and I would put a plug in if you guys do not have FirstNet phones, each of you should, is to call Kip Harkness and say, how are you doing? <laughs> and where are you? And are you on your way to the EOC? And then most importantly, uh, Kip asked the question, how are we making the decision to activate the EOC and how does that occur? Thank you, Lee. And I would also pick up on my first net phone with the prioritized band 14. Um, and the answer in a case like this would be very obvious. It would just be a, an instantaneous activation at level one. And even if my first net phone wasn't working, I would just simply start moving toward the emergency operations center by car if I was in it, by bike if I was on it, or on foot, and have kind of pre-rehearsed all of those routes in my head many times and taken them. Um, we would be activating the larger EOC with probably a full, full shift roster. The blue shift that I lead would be the first shift in and we'd begin the Everbridge notifications, which Everbridge will begin to reach out to you automatically with a message on how and where to report, um, either emailing you and then texting you and then texting you at your other number and emailing you and texting you um, and basically doing everything possible. Uh, the probably the chat, uh, chat GPT version will come over and 
drive over to your house um, <laughs> until you respond in the affirmative or the negative. If you respond in the negative, we'll immediately try to find a replacement and begin th that step and process. The expectation is it probably takes us a couple of hours to, to assemble into the EOC and get it going. That's why we're not holding back any of the field operations. Those are ongoing while we gather. Thanks, Kip. Um, you touched upon the, those first few hours. What um, what is the emergency operations plan or emergency action plan and what would the first few hours why would the first few hours be focused on that yeah so we have we have a whole series of plans the, the emergency operation plan really is a framework for how we r respond which has codified all of these practices and is in alignment with federal and state guidance and then around that there i think we've got about 16 different plans and annexes that go into detail on things like debris management and uh, or, or housing in time of an emergency. And that uh, all allows us to have thought out in advance mental rehearsal for what is most likely to happen in the, in the range of threats that we are most likely to face. And so that allows us to, to pull those off the shelf, either literally or virtually, refresh our memories and begin to focus on the most important things. The, the key role of the Emergency Operations Center is to protect the most vulnerable and those who are going to be most burdened in any, in any disaster emergency. Unfortunately, we know those are often very much going to be working class people, people of color, recent immigrants, um, those of fewest means. And so our, our top priority is always their lives, followed by the protection of, of property, followed by the environment. And so we will begin to staff up the Emergency Operations Center in response to those priorities in that order. Okay. Total each. Can I, can I yes, you may. So what I'm curious about is, so, so part of it is, okay, is very centralized. It happens in very d uh, unique places, right? It doesn't impact, I would say, most of the city or most of the employees of the city, assuming they live in San Jose. This type of disaster has the potential to impact a much broader base of employees. So what I'm curious about is how do we manage a situation in which many employees are unable to report or unwilling, right? Because they got to take care of their own family, which I totally understand. Uh, well, you know, let's answer the second part second because that, that's the next question I have for Kip. But Kip, why don't you answer that? What is, how are we trained and specifically the, the roster with shifts in the EEOC where there's redundancies? Yeah, so of, of course every employee is a disaster service worker and knows that they're obligated to respond. Obviously they can't always do that because they have other people they need to protect and take care of and they may not be able to fulfill that role. The people who have volunteered to be in the emergency operations center understand that they need to take an extra level of preparation and preparedness. Um, in my case, for example, I was just talking about this with Ann this morning, she knows that she's instantly in charge of the household and uh, she's going to take care of that and whatever shape that takes, I'm headed in. I've got my go bags um, in my car. I have a go bag in the emergency operations center and I'm dedicated to getting there as is pretty much everybody else around this table uh, come, come hook, crook or high water. Uh, and if we're not able to, for whatever reason, we do have backup shifts and multiple shifts. In an event like this, we'll be needing to run 24-7 for at least a little while, so we'll be doing back-to-back 12-hour -back shifts. But we have a third alternative group to draw on to fill out any gaps for people who aren't able to or are on vacation in Hawaii or whatever the case may be, but, uh, but simply can't report. On the continuity of operations side, I think you're better placed to answer that in terms of the overall city employees. Yeah, and I mean, we, I, and I do want to go to your second question, um, but I'll start with the first. Uh, you know, on the, we have outside of the EOC um, department operations centers as well that are actively supporting the field, coordinating with the EOC. Those take resources as well. Um, the continuity of operations, those people, while there's not a specific notification, are, have all been trained to to report back into departments very quickly, especially around critical infrastructure. So department personnel and ESD, public works, transportation, all are pretty closely coordinated um, to for events like this. And you know w how we decide to activate in this situation is pretty clear. Like when you fall over from the earthquake, <laughs> that's probably an activation. I will say there's several events that Ray outlined where there's um, probably hours of conversation between Jennifer, myself, and Kip, 
we activate on Tuesday or Wednesday? Uh, or what does that forecast look like? Or what's going on? So there is a lot of conversation about that. Um, and then just lastly, even within the EOC and the shifts and then staff that may be pulled into a continuity of operations plan, which is all 7,000 employees, understand their backups and can communicate amongst them as well. And, and then in an earthquake, you mentioned about the localized nature of flooding, which is absolutely correct. I, to a surprising extent, there's earthquakes are f can be fairly localized as well. There'll be vast parts of the city that people are scared and have sh been shooken up, but they really have no damage or no issue. And in an earthquake, we'll be able to draw very immediately on statewide resources that will hopefully begin pouring in yeah. over a 72-hour period. And so those are a couple of differences in terms of, of what we'll be able to respond. Yeah. The, yeah, I didn't intend for it to be that long, so I apologize. Well, but that I was appreciate, on, that was I on appreciate us. The, no, but I yeah, appreciate no. the answer. It was, it and and what you got me to understand is there's, <laughs> it goes much deeper. Because I was thinking immediately, what if folks can't respond to the EOC? But even if you do get all folks responding, how do you make sure the departments yeah. are backfilling? <laughs> so there's, yeah, th yeah. there's a lot of redundancy. Even Correct. just like with EOC director, if Kip wasn't able to make it, I've been trained, Angel's been trained, Dolan has been trained. There are, there are other folks that can step in. Um, that's why the importance of emergency management training and why you know, we've been able to double down on it in past years in the budget is so critical, critical because you end up in instances where people may not be able to come in the, you know, um, in the case of an earthquake or like what we experienced in COVID. I mean, we can, we talk about tracking hours. There, there were about 100 people in the city that worked an average of 300 hours that March, April, and May. And those people needed to be rested, you know, later on down the road. So other people need to step in and, and, and help. I think to the second part of your question, that was gonna be one of my questions to Kip. Um, quite frankly, my, my first call actually might be to my wife after the earthquake to s have a similar conversation with her, um, but we've had that. But Kip, I know Ray has trained you and I and, and Jennifer and Dave Sykes very well. So what are some of the things that you've done personally to ensure the second you get up after falling over from the earthquake that you can head directly over to the EOC. Yeah, just pragmatically, I don't have any I don't have any uh, pictures or anything hanging over me on the bed, so there's nothing to fall over onto me when I'm sleeping or, or, or glass to shatter. All of the large ap appliances are bolted to the wall so they won't tip over. I have slippers under my bed so that I can put them on so that if I need to walk out, I won't walk on broken glass because there'll be broken glass. Um, I have my go bags ready to go. Um, I have uh, in all the cars. I exercise seven hours a week so that I'm fit and ready to go into the EOC. And, and, and I'm not joking about that because I view this as an endurance event. Um, and then I do 40 hours of minimum extra training every year uh, to ensure that I'm thinking about this and planning on this. And then of the books that I read on a yearly basis, uh, I try to make sure that at least six of the 24 are directly related to emergency management to prepare myself mentally and be thinking about the different aspects of it, whether it's cybersecurity or whether it's resilience of the community or whether it's racial injustice issues that need to be taken into account. So that I'm, I'm doing the mental rehearsal and preparation pretty much all the time so that it's, I'm not surprised when it happens. Council Member Foley. Thank you, Kip. You're not surprised, but the residents are. <laughs> and and I, I just wanna put on a resident's hat this is a real world experience for me. I actually lost my house in the 1989 earthquake. My hu we, it was up on Summit Road. The house went down the hill. My husband was in it. I was down here on the Alameda. The immediate response from me was, you know, you're shaking and you're going, oh shit, what the hell just happened? And is my husband okay? So. I'm putting my hat on of, okay, I gotta protect my husband. I've gotta do what I can to get up to him on Summit Road. I try to go out to my car. I'm freaking out. Um, my father-in-law said, and I'm sorry, this is gonna be a long story because it's really very impactful and timely given what we're talking about right now. And my father-in-law said, you can't drive up there. We have cell phones then, but not the kind of cell service we have now. My, hus my husband couldn't reach me. I could not reach him. I visioned him in a pool of blood, uh, dead. Um, and at some point, I eventually get in the car and start heading up the hill. And what do I encounter? Traffic, going 
nowhere. He, at the same time, by the way, he's alive, so, you know, 40 years married, he's made it, but he's coming down, <laughs> the, he's coming down the hill as I'm going up the hill. I don't know I'm going up the hill. I don't know he's coming down the hill. He doesn't know I'm coming up the hill. I get off. I'm yelling at everybody on the road. Everyone get out of the way. And I'm wondering how police and fire are going to get through the massive road closures that's going to occur from everybody hitting the road at the same time to try to check out where their loved ones are. So that's when I think about a disaster, I think it from the, this type of disaster. I think about it from the resident's point of view, how we've really, how I've lived it and I know, and how, and so that's one question, and I'm gonna burn my second question just now. Go for it. Okay. Who then of all of this team is going to help our residents interact with FEMA and Red Cross? Because the result is we've lost our home, we, the community, many have had serious damage to their homes. They may have lost their lives. What's next? Emergencies declared, FEMA comes rolling in, and the Red Cross do, and they are there to help us. But we need to help our residents. So which of these team members are gonna help us with FEMA and Red Cross? So we'll, we'll start, I'll start and with that, the- And I realize yeah. that's further down in your scenario, but I, no, needed, no, it's a, it's I just great, needed to get it out. Yeah, those are great questions. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll take the first one and I'm gonna hand the second one over to Kip. Um, also, I, you know, uh, at Loma Prieta earthquake, I was at soccer practice with my best friend who lived off of Summit Road. They also lost their house and they, they lived with us for about a month before they could even get up to their property to uh, see the damage. So. Uh, truly understand that that was a horrific thing. I would say a few things, and you know, why I ask Kip, what have you done to, to prepare yourself, um, is all of us as disaster service workers in this room have a responsibility once that ground shakes. We cannot do our job effectively if we were worried about our family. If I have to worry about Emily, Abby, and Adam, I'm not gonna be effective on behalf of Jennifer and for you guys. So the, you know, the the disaster planning having the conversations we <laughs> have probably overdone it and have a lot of uh earthquake backpacks throughout the house and outside in sheds and extra water um and a lot of different you know dry you know freeze dry food in case of those scenarios as well as communication plans um and i would say all of us that end up having first net phones it's important to use your first net phone not just for business um, so that we can get through to each other in disaster, but it also frees up the other local networks. So people that don't have that luxury or the responsibility of being a disaster service worker possibly have bandwidth on the other lines to get through to loved ones. The second part I would say that's critically important is, as Kit mentioned, there's gonna be areas of the city that fare okay, and there's gonna be areas of the city, especially the soft stories, that are a complete disaster. Um, and so we're gonna focus on the most vulnerable as quickly as possible, but that also means our other residents need to be in a position to take care of each other, themselves and each other. And so the CERT trainings that we've been able to double down on, um, training coordination, not only for ourselves, but for the community is critically important so that they have tools to go ahead and do that. But I would, I would just say, as we continue on in this conversation with you guys past today, um, Ray and Jay and his team working with all of you to ensure that you guys also have that, those plans, uh, communications plan and disaster plans just for your household is important because you'll be called upon, as you know, that th those of you live through COVID very quickly to communicate to your constituencies. Um, we'll, Omar, we'll go to you next. I do wanna... Um, yeah, no, 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 I'm, I'm gonna go to oh, Kip okay. for, for, I would say, 1B of your question and then number two as well, because those are EOC questions. And I'm actually gonna use that to start the scenario rolling. So we're right. all in the EOC, we've had, the, we've had it, and it's been going. I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna turn to Chief Sapien, who in this case is leading the fire and rescue branch. And Chief, I want you to give us a sense of, of how, what, you're, what you're seeing from the EOC and also what the, the direction to the crews in the field is gonna be in those first couple of hours. Uh, from a fire perspective. Okay, so I in reflexing to the initial shake, uh, our crews have a, a pre-plan in place which will involve uh, assessing their ability to maintain response readiness 
Uh, two, they're going to test their communication networks to make sure we still have radio and uh, w whatever telephone might be available, uh, satellite phone if necessary. Um, and then they will begin an area survey. Uh, to your question about traffic, uh, our initial plan assumes some level of traffic congestion, and so the crews are essentially going to be operating in their response areas, possibly isolated uh, because we won't be able to move freely uh, throughout the city. So that is part of our, our response plan. Uh, as we move to uh, reflex, uh, we'll initially recognize that something of this scale will likely overwhelm our available resources. And so we will activate a department operations center which will begin to uh, make sure that we are planning for a continuity of, of operations. And many operations may be very physically uh, demanding, and so we'll have to figure out a rotation of, of our workforce uh, relatively quickly. Um, as we are able to staff the emergency operations center, uh, we become uh, the link between that department operations center and what their objectives are and the EOC, and from the EOC perspective, we begin to support the needs of operations. Uh, we will assume that there will be multiple large-scale incidents in the city, and uh, so we will be supporting multiple incident commanders uh, who will be in contact with the DOC, who will relay the needs to the EOC. Thank you, Chief. I'm going to go to uh, Commander Rick Scott on this. In this uh, instance, uh, Rick is going to be our transportation branch lead. You're going to be thinking a lot about those routes. What does that first 24 hours look like for you? A big part of our first 24 hours is ensuring strong communications with our department operations center. We have uh, zones throughout the city that our crews know where to go. Uh, they'll be giving us information about what's going on, and then we'll be able to kind of establish a solid operational picture um, what's going on, what, what is the damage assessment looking like, and I think leveraging uh, the Department of Public Works FIT teams as well to kind of get an understanding of, of how the routes are looking. We'll be in, in close contact with fire and PD to understand just the overall operational picture, you know, what, what are the priorities, what are the routes. We'll be establishing communications with uh, other transit agencies in the area, Caltrans, VTA, et cetera, to kind of see what their picture looks like, what the roads are, are, are like if we, you know, need to uh, guide people to evacuation centers or shelters or things like that. Um, and then really just establishing those close communications, as I said, with the DOC to support the field and, and hear what their needs are so that if we need logistical support or mutual aid really quickly, uh, we'll know who to reach out to. So I think, I think that kind of summarizes what we're trying to get a picture and a handle on really quickly. Um, and then obviously, you know, I will be taking the strategic direction from the EOC and trying to translate that down to the DOC and I'll be getting a good picture from the field from the DOC, trying to bring that up to our uh, ops chair, uh, ops chief, so that they understand uh, what our teams are facing out there. Thank you, and so we've actually got the, the DOC function here. Jennifer Sagan is, is in the DOC. What's, what's going on in your world in that first 24 hours? Hi, Jennifer Sagan, Division Manager of Transportation. Um, in this scenario, I'll be the DOC Director for Transportation. Um, we're gonna be focused largely on triage and removal of debris, so we uh, understand emergency routes that have already been identified pre-disaster and we'll be focusing on those as well as situational awareness from our field staff. You know, they've all been told if something like this happens, stop where you are and take a look around and take pictures of what you see and start to report back in so we can get some situational awareness. Um, we'll also be working closely with Public Works on uh, damage and condition assessments of sanitary and storm sewers pavement, sidewalk, curb, gutter, et cetera, traffic signal, street lights. Um, but primarily our focus will be on doing what we can. We, we've inventoried our fleet of uh, dump trucks and other debris removal equipment and all of our utility vehicles will probably become debris removal vehicles. Thank you. Now we've talked about a little bit about sort of the communication question. How are we getting the word out and, uh, to, to the community? We talked, you mentioned a little bit later about the CERT piece um, I want to. Uh, I want to have a communications perspective and a cert perspective. Did you want to interrupt now? Councilman? We have a. We have an interruption next Great. door to me. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. No. So I think we all have our. We all have our 1989 uh, horror stories, and uh, so glad that uh, Mr. Foley made it out uh, alive. But what I clearly remember in 1989 uh, is, you know, my family was already home. Um, 
because my dad was a huge A's fan. And so we were watching the A's and the Giants about to play. Uh, so everybody was home. And at that time, I actually lived in the basement, by the way. So, uh, so the 1989 earthquake in a basement would never, ever want to feel that again. Uh, but uh, at that time, we were still a monolingual family. Uh, and we had no idea. We had no idea what to do. So that's the question that I'm going to ask is uh, because obviously Councilmember Foley experienced the traffic getting to her, 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 her husband. Uh, are we gonna are we gonna tell our residents to stay in you know uh, stay in shelter or shelter in place or ask them to go to an, a, a massive evacuation site if we have one because I think we want them to be off our street but then we also for those who are not uh, their their houses didn't collapse or are safe are able to stay where they're supposed to stay so. EOC question. Yeah, yeah and, and as the EOC director, my general guidance is, and we talked through this with as a team, but it's going to be if 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 you can be where you are and you can be reasonably safe, stay where you are. If you can take care of yourself, take care of yourself. If you can take care of others, take care of others. Um, but I I turn to Carolina on how we'd start to communicate those kinds of Correct. messages yes. and how we'd reach out to the broader community, and then I'm going to turn to Chris in terms of what role CERT will be playing in exactly this circumstance. Carolina. Thanks, Kip, and thanks, Councilmember Torres. Great, great question. Uh, I too was still a monolingual family at that time. Um, so, what we use in communications and for EPAO, it's very important that we use the AIR model, which is alert, inform, and reassure. There's going to be three top messages that will be multilingual messages, culturally appropriate, because I do not believe in direct translation. When you have emergencies, you lose a lot when it's a direct translation. Um, but one is how to be safe. <laughs> so we're probably going to be talking about you're going to feel aftershocks, and here's what you do during an aftershock. How to stay safe. Uh, so how to keep your property safe as well. Turn off your gas. Don't go or get out of damaged buildings. And then eventually where to go, when to go, and how to get there. So that's the shelters, evacuation. Um, medical assistance. I don't know what our hospitals will look like if we have this sort of earthquake. So it still boils down to protecting lives, property, livelihoods, and our environment. Thank you. Chris, can you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about how you'd be uh, dealing with CERT? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Kip. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Lasavio. I'm the CERT coordinator for the city of San Jose. Um, so, so in this type of scenario, we have 800, about approximately 800 trained uh, CERT volunteers currently. And the first priority during a big earthquake like this is to take care of yourselves, your families, and your neighbors. Um, and so our team is constantly uh, training on this uh, and, and learning all different types of techniques. But at the very biggest, the biggest reason why we do CERT is so that people are more prepared during these, these incidents. Now, uh, if we were going to officially activate the CERT team, I would be coordinating with the operations section to see where CERT might be able to plug into the operation. So that would be all at a coordinated effort. Um, for instance, during uh, the, the most recent atmospheric storms, we were supporting in a variety of capacities. So we were helping um, supplement the Red Cross uh, in the shelters. Uh, we are staffing the daytime warming centers. Uh, we are helping to do knock and talks at mobile home parks. Uh, and doing some homeless outreach as well. So the nice part about our CERT team is we can kind of plug into a variety of ways. Uh, we do train on things like uh, triage and basic first aid, uh, cribbing, so helping to get heavy objects off of folks, how to turn off your gas, how to use fire extinguishers, stuff like that. Uh, and we also give out preparedness information on, I, I think someone mentioned like how much stuff we should be able to keep in our house. Uh, to keep ourselves safe and sustainable for 72 hours or more. And we give out that kind of information as well. So that's the first thing. Right. So I'm going to keep, keep rolling. Um, so uh, Captain Matchett, you have the law enforcement branch role here, which has a number of different pieces. Uh, could you talk about how two things? Uh, one, how, what coordination you play with law enforcement in the field in general, and specifically a, around how you'd be thinking about evacuations in a scenario like this in an earthquake? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I think um, with regards to evacuations, uh, what we really want to do is encourage people to, to shelter in place and to the extent that they can to care for themselves for the next period of 72 hours or so. 
Uh, also encourage them, <clears throat> excuse me, to stay off the roads as they will be impacted by um, emergency response personnel uh, to help as well. So with regards to an evacuation, um, I don't see us necessarily providing a mandatory evacuation order or suggestion that people should leave their homes unless it's perhaps uh, in the downtown core area where it's uh, you know, a very dense populated area. Um, and I want to touch on, on Council Member Foley's question with regards to the roads as well. Um, you know, we're very lucky. We have a tremendous amount of support from the community and, and, um, and city council with respect to equipment. And if we need to shift from, you know, driving uh, vehicles to two-wheel motorcycles or even utility vehicles to try to serpentine around traffic, we have the ability to do that. But again, we're law enforcement and working with our partners at the fire department, DOT and Public Works, we can close roads and we can encourage uh, people to uh, utilize, um, you know, foot traffic to get to and from. And this also goes back to what um, Lee and Kip, you guys were talking about in terms of being prepared. Uh, everybody in the police department uh, operates on the same assumptions that, that you guys have with respect to caring for our families. And as soon as we realize that they're safe, they're going to be calling the police department and asking what they can do. And we're going to be asking them to come in. Uh, we're going to be holding over shifts. We're going to be shifting our priorities to uh, life preservation functions and away from other um, smaller priority three and four type calls. And um, we're going to ask those uh, officers to, of course, call their families, ensure that they're okay, and they're going to be sticking around for a while. And then we're going to shift to probably 12 on, 12 off, uh, or, or something that um, uh, helps with the function of, of having you know, the best bang for our buck. Thank you. Thank you. We have an interruption. All right. Council Member Batra with his first interruption. Okay. Um, see if I got it correct that uh, your, the huge success of this plan is assuming that our EOC centers and DOD centers, whichever we have named, they will physically survive the 7.2 earthquake and their infrastructure will continue to work uh, because of their communication capabilities and all that. And the people who have been designated, they will have the ability to be able to get to those physical centers, EOC center or DDO center. Is, is that impression correct? Uh, I, I would say, I think, um Going back to the Prussians, right? Every good plan changes once it impacts with uh, the actual war, right? And so we are preparing things like the build out of the new emergency operations center to make sure it is extremely able to withstand an earthquake. Um, and we are doing everything we can to hit that scenario. We don't plan for the ideal or expect the ideal in any emergency. The key thing is resilience and agility. If we have to do this virtually, we now know how to do it virtually. If we have to do it out in an open field, we can do it out in an open field. If we need to pull in a cow and a colt, uh, sell your on wheels or sell your on light truck in order to get um, the cell, cell uh, performance, we will. If we need to ask AT&T to fly a plane over so that we can get that cell coverage, we will. Um, so all of those contingencies are available to us, and that's some of what we would be problem solving very immediately in the EOC, is what structure do we need to take given the reality? And if it's four of us who show up, the one of the rules of the Emergency Operations Center is until you the other person shows up, you have that function. And so uh, we will assume the functions as, as needed based on the reality of the situation and adapt to it as it goes forward. That, that is, though, why we are investing extra money in the EOC to make sure it's that level of resilience to an earthquake, all of those communications. But that said, we don't expect things to go to plan. We expect them not to go to plan. Um, and that's why the agileness of the organization is the most important thing, in my opinion. Right now? Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. So uh, uh, that's great. And the communications which we have covered, we have covered between the EOC council members, DDOs, and all that, and also one-way communication to the public from public information officer. Do we assume that our medical facilities in the town and other emergency services will continue to operate properly? And do we have a way to train our people that they will know 
where to call. We will proactively send this information to them, but if they see somebody's hurt, they want to be able to reach somebody, do we call still 911, or we have some special training to do for our residents that what will be the ideal place to seek help? Yeah, so there's a lot to that. I'm gonna throw a little bit of this back to the, to the crowd here. Um, but or the crew here, but let's, Ray, it looks like you're ready to lean in. Go for it. In terms of the hospitals, uh, they all meet the seismic standards that they were built at the time. The county manages the health centers, and all the, all the hospitals, from my understanding, have a surge capacity plan, so if more people come to the ER than expected, they have the ability to, to expand it into the parking lots and other systems to make sure that they are capable. Uh, the 911, Dispatch Center is in an essential services building, so it should survive. Uh, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, Captain or Chief, uh, 911 is the number for medical emergency during an earthquake event. Yes, and there's m multiple layers to that question. I think there's a, a, a baseline training level that CERT provides for first aid, so controlling bleeding, stabilizing, that sort of thing. Um, the, the reality is is that while we will have the 911 system, it's still going to be a question of what resources are available to respond, meaning what is the capacity of the fire department to continue its first responder service, what is the capacity of the ambulance companies to continue uh, their transport services, and then as you asked, what is the capacity of the hospital to receive patients. Uh, there are plans, as, as Ray talked about, for surge capacity but there's reflex time that would have to occur. So it, it would go back to your original question, which is we have to evaluate what resources we have available and reflex by way of the fire service norm is mutual aid requests. So once we realize we don't have our, our uh, ability to respond, we then initiate mutual aid from outside of the hazard area to come and assist. Clarification on that. So, are you going to give us some material which we should be training our people on? To get there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the other piece that we're going to need to do in parallel to this, I just want to make clear on. I want to lean on Lisa Joyner and uh, uh, think a little bit about help us think a little bit about damage assessment and what that's looking like from your perspective within that first 24 hours. And then we're probably going to go over to the the DOC to ask the same question on the inspection side. Uh, good afternoon, Lisa Joyner, Deputy Director of the Building Division within PBCE. So initially, uh, right off, we're going to activate our DOC with Bill Main, and I'm sure you will hear from him shortly. Um, and we're gonna establish our communications between our DOC and the EOC. Um, as part of the activation of the DOC, we're going to switch all of our messages so that all of our inspectors, when they call in, know where to report to, and it's one of four fire stations within the city. Um, we're going to coordinate very closely right off the bat with Public Works and with our 911 partners on any essential buildings and shelter facilities that need help with inspection to make sure that we have those up and running and identified right off the bat. So initially in this, in this first 24 hours, it's really more of a safety assessment than a damage assessment, making sure the facilities are safe for people to go to. Then we're gonna work on the uh, windshield surveys of the areas of the city identified with our 911 partners as having the most damage to go through and start doing the rapid assessments, focusing on grocery stores, pharmacies, Home Depots, Lowe's, places that are gonna be able to provide support to our community as well as, you know, it's a rapid assessment of yes, you can occupy, no, you can't, right off the bat, keep people in their homes. Um, so that's really gonna be the focus of the first 24 hours, as well as when we're going through these windshield surveys, it's also going to help inform us for how much mutual aid we're gonna need to ask for. Thanks, and going to the, the Department of Operations Center and the inspections, uh, Bill Main, Mr. Main, what, what are you and your crews gonna be, be doing? Uh, initially off the offset, so um, our building operation plan actually activates at a 6.0. So once we hit a 6.0 earthquake, um, I will be switching over the uh, message for the inspection team to report to their four fire stations that's been reported out. 
At uh, that point in time, the DOC is also active, and that's when I report in as well. And I start running all field operations for um, all assessments, first for safety, as Lisa said, and then once we transition from safety assessments to damage assessments. Um, really, off the beginning, uh, we will assign um, inspectors for their safety assessments itself, but also to Council Member Foley's question regarding uh, local assistance centers will also be dispatched out from the uh, rest of the team that are not evaluators or um, also coordinators for the disaster are going to be actually doing the survey. Code enforcement officers, planning, uh, permit technicians will be assigned as local assistance centers inside your DDOs to be able to provide information for your constituents um, in different languages, uh, rather be where uh, um, shelters are at, where they can buy supplies at, um, if there's going to be um, no sewer and water, where are we going to have it dropped off daily, right? Where are those things going to be at? So, so planning, building, and code enforcement will be assigned to also um, have our workers go into your DDOs and provide that information to your constituents as well, all right? So we are a partner at that point in time, all right? Um, but really, initially, we want to, just like Lee said, uh, uh, make sure it's safe uh, for people to occupy, and we want them to occupy. We don't want them having to go to shelter. So if it's able to occupy, we want them to stay home, um, and we want them to be able to occupy the residence as we move forward. Okay. Thank you. And I, I want to put that out to give a little bit of perspective to your, your question, Council Member Batra, because I think it, there's going to be a real disconnect, a real psychic disconnect between the individual perception of the emergency and the citywide emergency. I was walking down the street, the earthquake shook, I fell, I broke my arm. Well, that's a big emergency for me. But in this case, you may be in a situation where a fire truck that would normally be responding to that or a medical response might just drive straight past you with a broken arm and that's actually the right thing for them to be doing uh, because that broken arm in that case is probably something that you can deal with for a little bit longer and as we identify perhaps a, a multifamily uh, structure that's completely down, that may be where we need to pay our attention or inf critical infrastructure that's going to power us or keep us going for the other things. And so part of what we need from the council members, to your point, is that communication, as Carolina said, of, of, of echoing and repeating and amplifying that communication that is really alerting them, informing them, and reassuring them. And to the maximum extent possible, if you can take care of yourself, take care of yourself. I'm going to volunteer Chris, because this is his job, that this is exactly the team that can work with you and your community now to begin those preparations of those key community leaders who can be echoing that message in your network. And so that's, that's really the key piece the information will be fluid and change very quickly on, on where to go and what to do. And the next piece I'll be coming to is the sheltering and how we'll be thinking about that, which is probably one of the key pieces. So I'm going to keep rolling if that's at least a partial answer to the question. Um, thinking about shelter, Neil, you've got the Mass Care branch uh, and have a lot of experience with this at this point. What are your, <laughs> <laughs> what are you, what are your thoughts and, and actions in this first 24 hours? Yeah, uh, thanks, Kip. So with Mass Care and Shelter, you know, our job is uh, to find these locations and to provide, uh, you know, the residents the space to uh, be able to either uh, reunify re, uh, with their families, get the information that's needed uh, to the public, and as well um, have a 24-hour overnight shelter case. Um, one thing that we do as we assess these situations, so listening and working really closely with Public Works and DOT to understand what in the city is safe, right? Um, that's gonna be one of our key things to know what areas of the city that we could actually stand up a shelter. Um, we anticipate uh, in emergency operations that about 10% of the affected population would need to seek outside shelter. The vast majority of people, um, as we were communicating here, you know, hopefully could take care of themselves or find a place to stay with their friends or their family, right? There's gonna be a certain percentage of people that we know, of course, are gonna need to have a separate place to go to. And that would be our job to figure out how to set this up. So our first thing that we'd be doing um, once the earthquake shakes, check on our family, um, get those things ready, head over to the, to the EOC. Um, we'd activate our Park and Recreation Departments or Mass Care DOC. Uh, we would activate the Red Cross uh, as our initial partner to help stand up the Mass Care shelters. Um, we'll begin with our assessment of our staff and how safe they are and what areas they can get to, rely with uh, Public Works and their teams to at least identify um, the facilities that we could utilize as a shelter. We currently have uh, MOUs with, um, us and the Red Cross have MOUs with all, most of all the high schools. 
uh, in the city to utilize those as shelters. We will utilize any of our community centers as possible, um, but with a you know potential 7.1 type of earthquake, the number and the capacity is a question that we're gonna have to solve. So we would be able to go out and, and working with the EOC management to look at places like SAP Center, uh, indoors as well as our parking lot, Avaya, um, a stadium. One of the things that we've learned around earthquakes is, um, especially from what we learned from down south, is that after the earthquake, not many people feel comfortable with coming to a place indoors. So there's a lot of need to establish a uh, tent shelter outdoors. Um, so that was kind of our, our key things that we'd be looking at, um, just making sure that we have uh, the facility that's going to maintain uh, to the expect, expected uh, percentage of population that we'd need to serve. Thank you, Neil. And now, Kendra, you, you've got the department to... Oh, okay. Just a, just a clarification. Neil, did you say 10% of the population? Mm -hmm. Of so the affected population, right. of anticipated affected population. So we're talking about, in an earthquake, we're talking about sheltering about 100,000 people? The, well, the anticipation, again, like we mentioned earlier, that not all of the city of San Jose would be affected by the earthquake, right? Certain neighborhoods, areas that we, we would say. So out of that subpopulation of people that um, we see the most damage, then we'd be estimating from that. But yeah, in a large earthquake like this, we would be anticipating a high number of people. And our particular attention is going to be going to the, the buildings which are most vulnerable, our soft story buildings, our multifamily apartment buildings that are pre-1978. Um, and that's where we have both the greatest vulnerability and also the, the, the most vulnerable populations in terms of very low-income people. And that's where our focus is going to be. But it's we're going to need to, it'll be, you know, it, one thing I would say is there's 7.0 7 earthquakes and then there's 7.0 earthquakes. There's a great deal of difference will matter on how close that earthquake is to us, how close it is to the surface, and which fault line it is. And that could have extremely different effects, even though the whole city is shaking. So we won't know until the event whether uh, which areas are truly impacted. I, 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 so that's, there are scenarios in which we could see those numbers, but those are very high level earthquakes, probably along the San Andreas and probably very close to us. So my follow-up question is, do we have an estimate on the number of spaces we have we're able to accommodate right now with all of our MOUs and including SAP and Avaya? We do for um, all of the facilities that we have and the MOUs that we have. We have the capacities identified for each of the buildings that we have access to. So what's the total? Uh, I would have to, I don't have the total like right now, but I'd have to annually change up. Well, less than 100,000, I can tell you that right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering how much less than 100,000, right? Like, are we at 10,000 or yeah. are we closer to 80? Yeah, uh, it's less than 100,000. I would r r remind everyone too, this is where, in addition to just our own city boundaries and the, the area of the city and what's impacted, there's a larger valley here as well. So in addition, we'd probably be calling for mutual aid around sheltering if we, you know, had this level of damage. Just as Loma Prieta, you know, Vasona and Oak Meadow Park became a massive shelter for a number of days. So, yep. you know, we've got ability to suspend policies um, and allow things in parks, ask for mutual aid in other cities to go ahead and ramp these numbers up if need be. Right, and, and with this, I want to lean in a little bit to Walter Lynn on logistics. You've heard a number of the different branches and sections report out on things that they will be doing and beginning to do. We've talked a little bit about the reflex time and the delay it will take to do those. Part of that reflex time is actually getting those resources in place and getting them to where they need to be. A uh, lot will be going on for you and your crew. Um, give us a sense of who you're going to bring into that crew and, and what are some of the pieces you're going to be doing in the first 24 hours around the, the logistics. Thanks, Skip. Yes, uh, under these scenarios, uh, it's going to be inherent that the EOC is going to be operated. We're not going to wait for that green light. We're already going to start mobilizing. So within our teams, we do have a core logistics group uh, that focuses on procurement, facilities, fleets, uh, even personnel, volunteers, things of that nature. Our immediate partners are going to be mass care operations, the EPIO, uh, finance as well. Uh, we want to make sure that whatever is needed from the immediate life safety and health and safety aspects, uh, we're going to get immediately. Uh, we have expertise in regards to procurement, and obviously with the magnitude of this type of event, everyone's going to be trying to get resources everywhere. So there's going to be a lot of competition, very similar to what we've seen with COVID and some of the other emergencies. Uh, we do have um, 
contracts uh, available and procurement means where we can find those uh, as immediately as possible. We are trying to be a little bit more proactive as well, looking at how do we start to, start to obtain materials ahead of time, uh, really have those in stock so we know the common items are being requested, uh, whether it's blankets, socks, um, water, food, um, things of that nature where it is uh, preservable, uh, having those in stock uh, ahead of time. Um, Chief Sapien had mentioned, and the PD had mentioned as well to Captain Matchett, uh, communications is gonna be key. Uh, so kind of doing a half hat of logistics, half hat of, of public works. Uh, the management of our radio communications is gonna be paramount also. Uh, so we do have uh, the ability to maintain and ensure operations of all of our radio communication towers and radio equipment, just to make sure that public safety and even non-public safety have that ability to have that communications ongoing. Um, within that infrastructure as well, we do have emergency backup generators uh, for those critical facilities uh, that we do have the refueling capabilities as well. Again, the city has fuel reserves and we will dedicate that for that emergency response. We've even gone through the standpoint of proactively indicating that for any non-emergency uh, types of activities during that emergency event uh, to really have those cease. So the fuel for those vehicles we're going to reserve for actually emergency response type of activities and really not waste the resources in case we can't get replenishment in a timely fashion. Um, those are the aspects of just constant communications within mass care, uh, EPIO, uh, within the EOC, um, and we go 24, 24 seven, uh, all the way through. And then a, a bit of a more a direct response to your question in terms of how we scale up. A couple of things that I'll be doing in coordination with the team and in planning is we're gonna put in some immediate requests for National Guard. Um, my, my father was a Marine Colonel Logistics Officer and so uh, grew up thinking about these things and th one of the things the military does extremely well is, is this work at scale very rapidly and so we would expect in a situation like this that we'd be coordinating with the county obviously because there are lots of jurisdictions that are going to be requesting this but making sure that we have that that level of request in we're also going to be reaching out immediately to the airport to make sure that we can supply a, a, an air bridge if we need to if the land routes are out and that we can get the logistics in through the airport as needed so that the supplies can, can start coming through. And so those are some of the things I I that we will be doing in parallel to allow us to scale very rapidly in terms of putting up the, as much capacity as we need, especially in the most severe events. It will exceed our capacity to do the sheltering. That's almost the definition of the scale of emergency. So we will, a lot of the planning and behind the scenes work in the first 72 hours will be bringing in the additional resources and coordinating them rather than just hoping that Roosevelt and Camden address the needs. Um, so with that, uh, Kendra, I'm going to throw it to you because that'll be very much uh, your world. What are some of the things that you're going to be doing at the Mass Care Department Operations Center in, in terms of, of, of preparing for a large-scale piece like this or responding to a large-scale event like this? Hi, I'm Kendra, Parks and Recreation. I'm our program manager, and I'm in charge of the DOC and uh, activation. Um, first, I want to make sure that, like, I know what sites we're going to be going to and working with Public Works to ensure that those sites are safe for people to be inside. I'll also be working with Neil to ensure that we've got a commitment from Red Cross if we're able to do so because they may not be available during a large scale event, which means the burden of staffing the overnight shelters would fall to Parks and Recreation staff or potentially other staff that we ask to assist as part of you know, a, a request just within like mutual aid within the city, but potentially a larger scale within the county coordinated through logistics. Um, if Red Cross is standing at the shelter, I'm looking to see what amenities we currently have at the site and if that will support the population that we're expecting. Um, I'm also coordinating with animal care because in the last two activations, we have allowed people to come with their pets. Um, and thinking of any other items that we would need, like showers, laundry, food, um, even, you know, comfort, people who are able to listen because people are scared when they're coming to shelters and people who can communicate with those who are not, you know, English speakers that may have another language, um, trying to get staff there that can talk with people as they're registering for the shelters and provide a little bit of support. But really standing at the shelters, making sure I've got all of the things needed to keep people safe. It's not gonna look like it is at home. It's not gonna be vacation or club med. You know, we're gonna be addressing, do you have a place to sleep? Do you have some food? Do you have water? and then we'll be waiting for the other things to come that can provide additional comfort. That, that, thank you, that leads into a question I have for Christopher Hickey. You're, you're in a role that's relatively new for us in the EOC with, based on what we've learned in the past. You have a direct responsibility around access and functional needs. 
um, decode that for us. What's access and functional needs and, and what are you going to make sure we're going to be paying attention to as a team in that, those first 24 hours in particular? Thanks, Kip. Uh, Chris Hickey, Public Works. Uh, the first 24 hours is really working with multiple branches, uh, Neo and Mass Care. Uh, I'm sorry, Kendra uh, from PRNS, DOC, uh, Chris from Emergency Response Team, as well as Carolina from uh, the information officer. But really, we need to, uh, my role is to ensure that individuals uh, with access and functionality uh, requirements and needs, um, individuals with disabilities, that the their needs are also taken into consideration with all of our planning, all of our aspects um, of planning, response, preparedness. Um, so working with the DOC regarding what those mass branch uh, facilities have, what uh, uh, accessibility needs are there, are these uh, able to, you know, can we move individuals and transport individuals uh, throughout the community to safe uh, shelters and, and those things. So it's very much uh, about the communication, transportation, and shelter uh, for our uh, community that needs it. So, Thank you. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that as a point and, and head over to uh, housing, mass care branch, the housing unit within the mass care branch, which is sort of a subdivision. Jackie, um, not everybody's going to have a home to go back to. Um, so beyond sheltering and the immediate sheltering, what's the role of the housing unit w in a disaster like this? And, and what are you thinking and worrying about? Sure. I'm Jackie morales friend. I'm the director of housing normally. And in this role, we're actually not thinking of the immediate uh, 72 hours, 24 hours. We're beginning to plan what's going to happen uh, and what will be our ability to close down the shelters. And so where are people going to go? Um, at the end of the sheltering. And so what we're going to be doing is I immediately thinking about and identifying our partners who are going to be able to help us with finding additional spaces. So that includes um, talking to the federal government, if it's a national disaster, the state, if it's a state disaster, uh, the county, we're going to be talking to planning, um, OED and real estate to, to tap into their resources of people they know. Um, public works, the private sector, which include people like property managers, hotels, Airbnbs. We are going to definitely be talking to our ADA coordinator regarding the needs of people. Uh, cadre, we will be coordinating with them and the, and the nonprofits that they work with. We're going to be building out a needs assessment to determine exactly what are the types of uh, needs that people have in addition to their housing. Um, as well, so that we can begin uh, to work with PRNS in start in setting up a LAC, which is that um, uh, local assistance center. And so, um, one of the things we have worked on. Can uh, you touch on the local assistance center for just a second more? Because I think it's a partial answer to Councilmember Foley's question. What is an, what is a local assistance center? Sure. So. Um, after all the immediate shock of what has happened and people are beginning to move into more of that recovery mode, um, the EOC is responsible for setting up a local assistance center and what that is really is a, I think of it as a resource center. So once we have identified what are the types of needs, people, for example, need to get driver's license again, they'll need insurance information, they'll need funding, they'll need clothing, they'll need, you know, whatever they need, we try to uh, locate one of the centers or the centers in areas that are most impacted, where people who are most vulnerable, where they would be able to get to those. So we might uh, set it up near one of the shelters. If we know that people are in their homes, but they're going to have to do recovery, we might set one up over there and be very specific with the type of information that they might need um, so that it makes sense uh, in multiple languages uh, and ensure that it's ADA accessible. Um, so we're thinking about, and, and then we would be coordinating with the mayor on fundraising immediately because <laughs> your ability to pay for this and to provide opportunities for people after a disaster if we can fundraise and get the public to be engaged in ways that they can help, um, that's a tremendous opportunity. And it's like 
the time to do it is when it happens because that's when people are are wanting and willing to give and one of the things we did during the two EOC priors is that we established uh, an account with the community foundation that allows us to activate uh, very quickly which I think is a huge benefit so um, so those are the types of things we're doing we're also beginning to think about like where can we place so if we needed to, if we ended up getting FEMA trailers, uh, where would we place all of those trailers? And again, one of the benefit, if it had, if only San Jose was impacted, it would allow us to look outside of San Jose as well, to look at where we could put temporary facilities so that people can stay. And then finally, one of the things we have implemented since the flood that we didn't have is a one-stop, um, shop that is a computerized program where we could feed in uh, availability of places where people could access resources for housing. Uh, we didn't have that the last time. We have that uh, support this time that will really help us to make matches. Thank you. I want to go to something that's a little more invisible uh, and then kind of wind us out with a question for recovery. But um, I, I head up the um, Environment and Utility C City Service Area, and I think of it sometimes as the invisible CSA because it, so much of what we do is literally underground. Um, I want to go to I want to go to Jennifer in the ESD DOC and get a sense of, of uh, while all this is going on, what are you worrying about, thinking about, and what are you taking care of and helping the field take care of? Great, thank you, Kim. Um, so for ESD, we're in charge of four primary um, utilities, three of them. Uh, having a, a major effect on the community, those being uh, wastewater collection and uh, treatment, um, water uh, distribution through Muni Water, and uh, our integrated waste management is responsible for uh, solid waste collection. Um, so rather than going into each of the individual um, divisions and the uh, priorities there, the, the main things that come up for us is, of course, activating our DOCs, um, including our communications division so that we could communicate with the community about different um, issues that are going on, um, establishing our communications to report up to the EOC through our ESD, who is our, uh, you know, our director over all of our DOCs. Um, uh, priorities would be supervisors confirming the safety of sat staff if the uh, event happens during work, which of course at the regional wastewater facility it's operated 24 seven, so there is a smaller skeleton crew there overnight. Um, so it's confirming the safety of staff and then moving on to assessing the facility and utility conditions to determine where need is to make sure things are operating. Uh, main issue at the RWF would be to make sure that we can assess our power system status. And thankfully we have multiple forms of powering that facility from our co-generation facility to our um, emergency diesel generators. Um, Muni Water also can operate uh, its pump stations off of diesel generators, so fuel for powering uh, Muni Water is a critical item. Um, our next step would also be uh, making sure that at the RWF in particular, the environment is protected after you know all of our properties and, and facilities are confirmed to be operational or restored. Um, so protecting the environment and if there is a release or some situation is pending, we need to communicate with our regulators to make sure that they're aware of what the situation is. Um, as a result of being regulated, we have a lot of plans and preparation for this that are detailed that are requirements. Thank you and, and just for context to just remind people that the, the regional wastewater facility can process on a typical day maybe 120 million gallons of, of uh, sewage coming through and the, the fines on a spill even during an emergency are extremely considerable. Uh, one last quick touch on some infrastructure, public works on the public works side in, in the both the uh, EOC and the DOC, what's going on for you and then I'm going to give it to Rosalind to close us out. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, my, name, my name is Matthew Nguyen, Deputy Director for Public Works. Um, in the EOC, my role will be running the public works branch. And um, the primary focus during the first 12 hours would be to activate the DOC, public works DOC, where we have a uh, few inspection team and also our trained SAP members um, 
who can go out to all of the city-owned facility and start the safety assessment. So our focus will be on community centers um, or other city facilities that can be used for um, can be used for um, a shelter and, and evacuation um, shelter. Um, so that will be the first focus for our team. And after that, um, we will also go out and start w working on the roadways and city-owned bridges and make sure that everything is safe. Um, if it's Caltrans, we also coordinate with Caltrans so that they can go out and evaluate their overpass. Um, we also will go out and look at damage assessment and safety for pump stations and other facilities in the city. Thank you. And in the Department Operations Center, Norm, what are you handling? Oh, you want to ask Maria's uh, public works. So um, for the first 24 hours, um, as, the, as the DOC chief, uh, my, my, my main responsibility is to get the Public Works DOC up and running. That means uh, getting the roster and staff uh, and, and with the activation of the DOC, making sure we have the uh, field inspectors, the field inspection teams available. And again, our role is to, uh, again, support PDC in the damage assessment. Um, we will also be helping in the coordination and conducting uh, the inspections of the potential mass care and shelter uh, um, sites that have been identified by the mass care branch. Um, we'll also assist and uh, conduct damage assessments for the city radio networks. Um, we'll also help with the coordination of the damage assessment with the utility providers. Um, furthermore, uh, Public Works is responsible for the damage assessment on, as, as Matthew stated, the pump stations for both sanitary and storm as well as the, con the collection systems. Um, and then so um, Public Works DOC, in the event that a, uh, an incident uh, command post is set up, um, Public Works uh, field staff will be the eyes and ears in terms of relaying resource requests as well as sharing information back into the EOC. So key main thing is communication and information sharing and in making sure that uh, that uh, information is brought back to the EOC as well as coordinating with the transportation DOC. And as we've seen in the previous, uh, the rain events, again, we would be coordinating with Valley Waters EOC in terms of uh, getting things out of the creek and debris and uh, monitoring creek levels. Thank you. And I'm going to touch, touch on a couple of roles before I hand it over to Rosalind. I don't have time to hit it quite everybody at the, at the tabletop here. Um, but uh, on the planning section, we have an incredible amount of uh, geographic information system experience, GIS experience, and situation status work that is going to, to consolidate, coordinate, and get all of this information out internally. You all mentioned the experiences during the, the atmospheric river. You mentioned Ross Creek. Uh, I literally had at 2 o'clock in the morning the ability to look up and see every 15 minutes a refresh, not only of, of what the gauge was at Ross Creek, but a picture of the latest thing. I knew who that person in public works field team or DOT fit, fit team was, had their contact information, and could look at that real time while I'm comparing that with the, the, uh, the rest of the information. And that was all built out by our public works uh, GIS center of excellence. And similar tools and GIS capabilities would be available to me and, and all of us as we, as we begin to gather and, and distribute this. O on the legal side, uh, uh, Cameron's role in legal team is actually extremely important because we're gonna be making <coughs> policy calls that normally we wouldn't make. We'd ask you to debate and decide probably for months at a time before we might make them. So we might have to say, hey, we have to do this mandatory evacuation in the creeks. What does that look like? And make sure the way that we're doing that is legal, is correct, and have that, that high level guidance uh, independent guidance in the EOC. Even though he's in the management section, it's a dotted line, not a direct line, because they have their autonomy to make sure that they have the independent legal guidance. And so all of this, all of this is going along. And while we're doing this, Rosalind, you're thinking ahead of a, uh, ahead of all of this. What are you thinking about in terms of the recovery of the people in our city while the EOC activation is going on in your recovery role? Yeah, Kip, this is. Um really an interesting role that, um, you know, I'm thinking in the first 24 hours of responding, we're also thinking about how our community is going to recover. And so the whole focus is really about how our community um, gets to a state of being stable and functioning, uh, really with the focus on those who have been most impacted by the disaster. So that's really our, our focus. Um, and as we've seen with the pandemic, right, it may not necessarily be recovering and returning back 
to our normal, but really understanding that we may be having to embrace a new normal uh, and a new way of doing things, of living, of accessing services. Um, and I think we understand that recovery, right, it happens in phases, um, you know, short, mid-term, and sometimes we find ourselves actually responding and recovering um, at the same time. Um, in recovery, our focus really has to be on people and their needs, right, and helping them actually heal from the disaster, heal from the trauma, so being super sensitive and making sure that we we are reaching people, we're asking them the questions of what they need, of what the new normal looks like. So it's asking lots of questions and really deep, deeply listening to them. I think our focus in, in terms of recovery, really to Jackie's point, it's like making sure people um, have secure housing, um, they have food security, they have the their medical needs met, and then in terms of focusing on those most impacted, particularly children uh, and our elderly will be a, a big focus. Uh, and then of course, some, uh, supporting our small businesses and even our large corporations, our companies, um, what resources they may need to recover for the long term, helping our workers, perhaps gaining new skills if jobs have been lost, that'll be an area of focus. Um, and then, like, engaging our partners, lots of partners, so our community-based organizations, nonprofits, our foundations, our, our large companies, people who can help with recovery um, efforts, uh, really engaging them for the long term. Um, and then, again, just understanding recovery can take years, and so it's about long-term plans for uh, stabilizing, whether it's getting our infrastructure back to um, a, a stable state. So planning for reconstruction, redeveloping. We may be right looking at uh, redeveloping actually neighborhoods or certain areas in neighborhoods. So really putting those plans in place for the long term. Right, and this will be a very long term context in an event like this. We still have not closed out the finances from the 2017 flood. We have a we have an interruption. Council Member Condellis. Yeah, I have an interruption. So uh, on the lens of recovery, <laughs> if we have um, a, a large scale uh, event like this earthquake that has the potential to, to wreak havoc on our main water lines that provide water to uh, the distributors, it's not necessarily in our control. What kind of mutual aid agreements or what kind of things do we have in place as a city to ensure not only that people are getting water um, or people have access to sewer systems and their you know access to be able to flush their toilet and or what what's in place so we can tell the community and and so folks aren't you know defecating in the streets or or you know relying on uh, bottles of water or relying on on us as a city to go deliver water to them or or I, I mean I, I'm I'm curious to know what what's our What's our strategy around things that not, aren't necessarily in our lane, uh, but that we we do or people see as a city? Uh, good question. I see Ray Reardon leading in, so I'm going to let him speak. <laughs> okay. Um, the city is a member of the California Water Agency Response Network, or CalWARN, which is a, a unified agreement amongst all water utilities and wastewater utilities in the state. And we can call upon those assets and resources to help recover the systems in a shorter period of time. As well as there's, uh, with that program, as well as with the state, there are uh, deliveries of water and other conditions that can be brought in from Cal OES, the California Office of Emergency Services, and FEMA, because they have assets that they've already stored for these kinds of responses in these kinds of uh, situations. And we'd be having direct communication with the key utilities and, and folks. Jay, you want to add in just a little bit about that, because you're right in that alley. Sure, so uh, Jay Guevara, Deputy Director of Public Works. My role in the Emergency Operations Center is Situation Status Public Works Utility Coordinator. Uh, <laughs> the past 14 events have, a, have been a blessing insofar as they've largely been focused on one single type of utility impacted by the event. In a 7.2 earthquake, it would be full spectrum, all utilities impacted, and we would need to reach out to not only water, uh, all wet, dry utilities, uh, those contained in the city, as already discussed with the DOC and all of our external partners, uh, being a conduit, pun intended, with those utilities to make sure that we can deliver the resources so that we can be safe. 
Yeah, it's, what we don't say in a thing like that is it's not our responsibility. That's where the heightened coordination, and, and if we do our job right, government at its best, but we understand whether it's a private utility, whether it's us, we have a re role in the emergency response and the coordination, effective coordination of, of it, especially around the vital utilities and, and core services. Councilmember Jimenez also has a question. Yeah, thank you. Um, so it seems to me that success in the immediate aftermath and long term is dependent on a lot of small decisions that sort of start trickling up and building up. But, but I, I can imagine that there's probably some larger decisions that need to be made. What comes to mind during the pandemic is, for example, deci us deciding as a city that we're going to feed the population as opposed to the county doing it. What, how do you go about making those decisions? In, in that case, it was an email that we got, a 15-minute conversation between, between the key principles and a, and a, and a yes. Um, but I think the, the, the key thing is, part of what we've learned to do as a team um, is, is to debate and decide very rapidly among those competing priorities. And I think it would be maybe useful to hear from both uh, Lee and the city manager on this in terms of that perspective of how we prioritize uh, the still scarce resources within that context. Yeah, uh, one of the things that'll be occurring as we start to go into to this event, there, there's a lot of communication at the EOC level with the county and other organizations. The county is the operational area, so that they have a big role to play. So we are a, a vast majority, I would say 90% of the coordination with other entities would happen at that level. Um, you did hear during COVID a, a MAC, or multi-agency coordination group, um, that never really materialized during COVID, maybe unofficially in some ways. One of the things that Jennifer and I would be responsible for in this scenario is talking to the county and having those conversations of the larger goal kind of informed based off of conversations with KIPP and our own services that we're able to stand up or not stand up. So if there's mutual aid quests back and forth, but also uh, other levels of conversations around policies like, hey, this week, this is gonna be the most critical or, or these next 72 hours is the most critical and there'll be some direction um, out of those conversations. And that will determine how we prioritize the COOP operations, but then also how KIPP and team would prioritize operations within the Emergency Operations Center. And, and as our practice had been, we'd put that in the form of a roadmap or whatever you want to call it that would be clear, ideally a single page, the same communications we'd be communicating to council, that we'd be communicating at the city manager's office level, that the EOC would have, that the DOC would have, that the field would have, so that there would be no confusion about what the priorities and the decisions were, be, were, were being made. And since we would be in regular contact with you, if we were off base or you had a different policy perspective, we're always open to your policy direction and redirection on what you think and know is most important as, as the representatives of the people. And so we would be doing w that with you in a very transparent level. There would be many cases where we would be acting without coming to you first because of the urgency of it, but we always have that ability to take direction from you as, as, this, as the situation evolves. We're determining, you know, in a very rapid manner, who is in the best position to provide what service. And then in that case with the food, with the county focusing on the health issue, we felt that we were being the, the largest body in the county, we were in the best position to, to get people food. So that's one of the major considerations is who's in the best position at that time based on that situation to provide the, the much, you know, very needed service. And with that, are we ready to... I Conclude? Yeah, so yes. we're uh, concluding the tabletop exercise. We, we're over time, so some of the Q&A that was for the very end, I think we will skip before we hand it back to, to Jennifer and the mayor. I will say just I did want to thank Nancy Ta and Karen Truong for producing the study session today. A lot of logistics go into these exercises, so <laughs> thank you to the both of them very much. And I would say to... To all the council members, especially the new ones, and we talked about this um, at your orientation, you were able to hear a little bit from Ray and team at the orientation on what this was. This was kind of a, a second toe into the water, so to speak. Um, but as you walk away, I would really think about the question of, you know, what do you need to be prepared as an individual, as part of a family, and then a community leader? And Ray and team will be reaching out to all of you in the next several weeks to set up those meetings and start having those conversations. And based off of what those needs may be, facilitate what that, you know, bringing in Chris on CERT or Karen and Nancy on, on community things or Alvin on training. So 
th there's a team there that, um, like all of us, that helps us train, will also be helping you over the next several weeks. So with that, turn it back to you, John. Yeah, I, uh, I think you had one last interruption yeah. oh, from sorry. the vice mayor. Sorry, I didn't see you, vice mayor. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. But you know, uh, this work is so critically important that when you need it, you just have to beat right on. So I'm just curious, um, if everyone in this room has a disaster preparedness plan for, for their family, for themselves, because I think that this work cannot be done, as you said in the beginning, unless your family knows if something happens, this is one, two, three, right? And I think that you know, if, if you haven't done it yet, please do it. You know, the Red Cross has a lot of resources that you can have, you know, uh, Kip mentioned the to-go bag. It's worth it, you know, because the, the minute that you need it, it's going to be um, at least some sanity for you and your family. So I know that the work that you do in the community is great, but, you know, if, if you're thinking about your family, then you know it's gonna preoccupy you. So same thing with the council members. If you don't have your Red Cross bag, <laughs> uh, think about doing that. It's a, it's a great investment. And to uh, council member Candelas, um, it used to come with a bucket. So if you needed a bucket, there it is. Uh, so so it's, it's, it's something that you hope you never have to use. You know, you hope you never have to use it. But when you need it, you're glad you have it. <laughs> very, very true. Okay, so um, thank you very much. Um, just in, in, uh, just wanted to say, I think you just saw one team in action here. This has been very impressive by the um, the employees in this in this room today, and it certainly makes me proud. I'm sure all of you can join me in being proud of our great city. Um, as, you, as you just heard, we are working hard and continuously training to ensure we're prepared for any disaster that we may face in the future because we need to protect and serve our precious community. Um, as we conclude today, uh, I really want to express my sincere grat gratitude to everyone who participated in these essential discussions. Uh, first and foremost, again, I really want to thank our dedicated city staff who play a vital role in responding to our emergencies. Your commitment to public safety and the well-being of our residents is commendable. Uh, it is crucial to remember that we all are first responders in a time of crisis, and we, remind, and we talk about that with every new employee that comes into this organization. Each one of us has a firm responsibility to ensure the safety and security of our community. To our city council members today, your role in supporting emergency response efforts is invaluable. I encourage you to trust the expertise of our EOC and give them the space to perform their critical functions. Please engage with your constituents and keep them informed, ensuring their concerns and needs are addressed promptly. Your ability to elevate issues and opportunities to our attention allows us to respond more effectively and efficiently. In times of crisis, the continuity of government is essential. City Council's steadfast leadership during a crisis ensures that our city can navigate emergencies and transition seamlessly into recovery, especially regarding making critical decisions on policy and budget during these times. As we do move forward, we will always prioritize the protection of our most vulnerable residents, as you've heard today. And that does include our low-income residents, people of color, our seniors. It's, there's many, many people in that group. And we will recognize their strengths as well. And for those that are least, uh, with the least, are often the most resilient and resourceful. And we've learned that, especially through the pandemic. Our resilience as a city lies in our ability to work together as one team, united in purpose and action. By embracing the collaborative approach, as you've witnessed today, we strengthen our capacity to overcome any challenge and build a safer, more resilient San Jose. Again, thank you for all your dedication and commitment to the safety and well-being of our community. Together, we will continue to prepare, respond, and recover from any emergency that our fine city faces. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. I, you know, Jennifer said it well. I just want to echo some of the thanks. I, I want to first you know, thank my colleagues for taking the time to be here for this study session. I know you're all very busy and have a lot of other things you could be doing, but I do think this is really important. I want to thank Jennifer and the entire administration and all of you in your colorful vests. You all look great, by the way. You know, I want to thank you for 
not just for being here for a couple of hours to give us some insight into how an EOC works and how we plug in and what we should expect, but for the fact that you've put in countless hours to be prepared. I know we got a little snapshot of that with Kip, who's taking his running routes to figure out how he can get to the EOC in a disaster. But I know that each of you have put a lot of time and thought into your responsibility in a disaster. And I, I just, I'm grateful for that. Um, and I'll also echo the Vice Mayor's point about how we, we all have a responsibility for being prepared and being able to serve our community, especially in our toughest times. Also just note, this is one piece of a much broader set of investments we're making. As you know, we have a new EOC that'll be coming online later this year. We are making investments thanks to Measure T in retrofitting four of our community centers to be ready to shelter people if necessary. I'm very interested in seeing us continue to invest in and expand CERT as a kind of wider net of residents who are able to give us that training and, and resiliency out there in our neighborhoods when first responders can't get there immediately. Um, the work we've started to kick off around soft story retrofits is a big deal. We've still got, as far as I know, over 20,000 residents who have heightened risk because of the building they live in. And so there's a lot of work yet to go, but I really appreciate the spirit of continuous improvement that we've undertaken as a city. And um, it, it really showed this year with the storms, how quickly everybody snapped into action, how clean the communication was. I heard from Valley Water, where we've not always had the closest working relationship, that they really appreciated how we were communicating and collaborating and felt that we were light years ahead of where we were just a few years ago during the flood. So I think it's just a testament to the, the focus and investment that you have all you've all made, and I appreciate that. Before we wrap up, we are going to have an opportunity for public comment, and I think we, I believe we have a mic set up here if, if there's any public comment from folks in the room, and I believe, Tony, we're also able to take public comment via Zoom, is that correct? Yes. Great. Yes, we have an individual who um, wishes to speak. Cole. Cole. Come on, Come on up. up. Say. I have an idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I really appreciate Chris bringing forward that we've got 800 certs. And I hope we get another 800 this year, thanks to your funding, Mayor Hint. The other thing I heard a few times that I really want to support is our cadre team, which are all the nonprofits being prepared with plans and getting ahead of the curve. Because as someone told me here yesterday, Having a relationship in the middle of a disaster doesn't really work. You gotta get ahead of that game. So I just really appreciate everyone in this room and what you're doing for our neighbors. You know, we the more neighbors we have ready, like that list that Kip let read out for his, his wife and family, every one of us wanna do. I've done it. But we need more and more of those because the first responders, uh, as I've been up to the Lower Lakes fire, I've been up to Paradise over and over again. It's neighbors helping neighbors, you know. You, you know already who those elderly are, who those functional need people are, uh, and just regular folks. You know, you can have a married couple with you here, your spouse or partner somewhere else, and your kids in two different schools. What's your plan? So I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you. used to doing that timer. Blair? Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks for the meeting. Um, just to kind of learn how to report and try to speak to these items. Uh, uh, two, two years ago, I guess it was, the beginning of the Biden administration, uh, then Mayor Licardo made a real uh, purposeful attempt to uh, start a new round of, uh, you know, cert training, emergency preparedness for the city, for the community. And I think he set out and done some really important good work. I think he said it specifically in the beginning to eventually work towards upcoming federal funding that you've had on a couple of previous council agenda items that we can be really be ready for that can help us a lot too. 
And at the same time he was doing that work, well, there was a lot of rumblings going around about uh, do we have to be pre actually preparing for an earthquake in the next few years, from uh, former Mayor Ron Gonzalez to former Councilperson uh, Perales. Raul Perales. Both were asking openly, you know, are those things having to be considered? So I've been worried about that too. And, you know, 2023 for me was the year that I thought we were actually preparing for. Since then, I've been learning to walk that back a bit and just simply, I, I think, try to consider how to uh, have good preparedness practices. I think San Jose has done better than any other city in the Bay Area. Uh, and I've been, I, I go to a lot of public meetings. Uh, they, they've had a really amazing amount of open practices in San Jose about how to talk about, you know, the CERT training. It's with all that in mind, it's my real hope that we are really learning how to openly talk. If there is an actual earthquake coming, can we talk about that openly? Uh, to make it as open as possible is how to be innovative and how to be just decent with each other to really prepare. And, uh, and if not, we're just simply doing really good practices right now. And thank you for that. And uh, either way, I just hope we can be open with each other about the subject. Uh, thank you. Back to council. Great. Well, once again, I hope we don't have to assemble to use the many skills and knowledge that you all have accumulated. But when we do, I'm, I'm really proud of this team for and, and, you know, having the confidence that we're going to be able to do a great job when we have to. So thank you all so much. And we're adjourned.